It is now time to crown a world champion. The following match is the finals of the 2016 Magic World Championship. Our first competitor is from Lisbon, Portugal, and enters the finals as the number two seed. Please welcome back to the stage, Marcio Carvalho. And his opponent, the number one seed from Roanoke, Virginia in the United States, Brian Brown Duin. Hello and welcome to coverage of the Magic the Gathering World Championship. I'm Marshall Sutcliffe in the booth alongside Luis Scott Vargas. And we are just getting the table set here for the finals between Brian Brondwin of the United States and Marcio Carvalho of Portugal. This is going to be a, a pretty close matchup because both players are, are re relying on collected companies. And the really big difference between the two decks is how many Thales lieutenants show up on BBD's side of the board. Okay, so that's going to be one of the critical cards that we're going to keep our eye out for as we move our way through this finals. Of course, we're going to be crowning not only a world champion, but also giving away $70,000 to the winner of the tournament here. There is a ton on the line between these players. Now, some of you may have noted that we've got our players wearing headsets, and we do have a reason for that. It's to block out our sound so that they can't hear you and I, Luis, talking about cards in hand and such. So we do have it set up, though, so that they can hear each other through the headsets so they can make all the necessary communications. So a Lamholt Pacifist is the first play of the game here. It comes on Brian Brown to inside. He does get to be on the play on this best of five match as he was the number one seed coming in from the Swiss portions. And then he has another copy of Lamholt Pacifist here. No land on turn yeah, two. Not, mi missing the land is, is tough. One of, the, one of the features of Collected Company is that the deck, despite having a low curve, plays 25 or 26 lands just because it really hates missing land drops. That being said, Lamehold Pacifist is one of the better cards you can play for two mana because if Brian Brown doesn't have a play next turn, he can flip both his Lamehold Pacifist to become slightly larger and much less pacifist. <laughs> they do, and he does in fact miss. He finds something that could come in handy a little bit later, a Knight of the White Orchid, but with that forest out, there's nothing he can do, and he is forced to just pass the turn back and transform Pacifist into Butchers, which are now 4 fours. The tough part from BBD's side of the board, though, is that, uh, well... <laughs> okay. Things are getting really tough for Brian Brondewood now. That is Declaration in Stone to Exile, both copies of Lamhold Butcher. He's going to get to sacrifice one of those clues to dig for a land, but that could have been the death knell in game one. Yeah, th this is going to be really hard to come back from, just the fact that Marcio is up a significant amount of time and mana and, and cards on board. The, the shining light here for BBD is that Marcio also didn't play a fourth land. So okay. there, there are sequences here, especially involving that Knight of the White Orchid, because if, if Brian can play land Knight of the White Orchid, get an untapped plane, play another, oh, no. play another card, that's a big deal. That's not what happened here. He did end up finding the land, but unfortunately for him, he needed to sacrifice a clue to get to it, it looks like. <laughs> BBD has to discard the hand size. He does. He has two copies of Thalia in hand, so he will discard one of those yep. before passing the turn back. And no there's problem. a land for Marcio Carvalho right off the top. He makes a clue, passes the turn, and this is not good news for Brian Brown doing as uh, Collected Company likely incoming here. Well, Marcio, e even worse, one, has Spellcaller in hand. And when you're ahead on oh, board, no. Spellcaller is just the, the best possible card. Okay. And that's exactly what he plays here. The uh, Reflector Mage from Brian Brown doing, attempting to uh, at least stave off death here, but unfortunately that is not going to be the case for Brian Brown yep. doing as Marcio Carvalho nice. looks to be in the driver's seat here to take game one pretty easily. Yeah, uh, miss, miss land drops against a deck that's very good at punishing you when you, when you fall behind is, is always going to be tough. And that Declaration of Stone was just like the icing on the cake. It was indeed, and that is, in fact, game one to Marcio Carvalho. He is up a game in our finals. We'll be back right after these messages. Whether riding the bus or waiting for the World Championship Finals to begin, Magic Duels is a great way to hone your skills and try new strategies. Featuring hundreds of earnable cards from Magic's latest sets and virtually unlimited AI and online opponents, start playing Magic Duels free today on iPhone, iPad, Xbox One, and Steam. You're invited to play with the new cards from Kaladesh early. Pre-release events are happening near you on September 24th and 25th. 
Contact your favorite game store and secure your spot today. And welcome back to the feature match area here. We're at PAX. We are in the historic Paramount Theater in downtown Seattle. You can see it's a gorgeous setting on which to hold a Magic tournament. Now I'm going to remind you, we are playing at best three out of five matches, or excuse me, games here to decide our champion. And what that means is that we're going to play two non-sideboarded games to kick things off, and then any games after that will be post-board. Right, if, you, if you're wondering what, why the players weren't sideboarding, they just shuffle up, play game two. That's right. Take a look at Declaration in Stone. It ended up being a, a key card in that game as it was able to uh, kill two creatures for just two mana. And when Marcio was already ahead on board, he was able to capitalize on that advantage. Certainly. Declaration, you do trade time for resources because you end up down a card most of the time. If you, if you target a token, it could be really effective. But if you do what Marcio did and target you know, actual creatures, your opponent eventually goes up a card because they sack all those clues. But BBD was not in long on time there. He had so few lands and he didn't have enough mana to really utilize all those clues before he died. So Declaration let Marcio get very far ahead. Marcio Carvalho now just two games away from a potential championship here. He's shuffling up his version of the uh, Bant Company deck. These yeah. decks do differ significantly. Th these decks are both, you know, you could both accurately describe them as Bant Collected Company, but that's kind of where it ends. The The fact that Brian Brown Duin is playing a, a, play a whole that. humans package, kind of frontlined by Thalia's lieutenant, you know, that's very different than Marcio, who's playing just all high-quality cards that don't may maybe work as well, quite as well together. So one of the advantages BBD has is his cards, like if you combine Lamholt, Pacifist, Thalia's Lieutenant, you know, Thraben Inspector, you're, you're talking about some cards that are underpowered individually, but together are very, very good, whereas Marcio has, you know, he has cards like Selfless Spirit and Spellcaller, which are just great cards, but they don't have, like, that much synergy. So it's the classic power versus sy synergy battle. I can tell you that Brian Brownduin has uh, taken a mulligan here as Marcio inspects his opening hand. It looks like he's decided to keep that. Yeah, Marcio, Marcio's keeping a two-lander here, but he's got island planes to go with his selfless spirit. And if he draws any land, he's got double spell queller plus a reflector mage. So Marcio really leading into the tempo aspects of the deck where you have reflector mage that can get you either ahead on board if you're already somewhat ahead or bring you back if you're behind. Mm -hmm. And then spell queller, which just is absolutely punishing if you have any sort of board presence. The downside of spell quellers, if your opponent has the luxury of playing around it, it, it can lose some effectiveness. But, sure. but when you have two creatures out and they have nothing, they just have to play a card, and then you just spell quell them right out of the tournament. Okay, Marcio is going to play his little cut game there as he uh, sets up Brian Brown to win for a six-card hand. Let's see if he has a keeper here or if he's going to have to go down to five. Does look like he's found a keepable hand. He's going to scry. Let's see if he puts it on the top or bottom. He's going to put it on the bottom. All right, so Brian's going to be on the play once again. After having lost the first game, he does get the choice, and uh, that could prove to be important here. Both players on two lands. Yeah, we are far from a constructed format where you would choose to go second uh, when you have cards like Collecting Company, Reflector Mage, Spellcaller. Another land off the top there for Brian Brown to win. Though it does seem like either land he plays is going to be tapped, I believe. Yeah, one, one advantage of leading with Evolving Wilds is that he can draw another basic, and then that Prairie Stream will end up coming to play uh, untapped. The downside of playing the Wilds versus the Prairie Stream is that you only get a land that taps for one color. But since the mana requirements in Brian Brown Dune, Dune's deck are not are not very strict, he's got Basically double white, single green, single blue for the most part, and that's that's pretty easy to meet once you have two dual lands. Yeah, by playing the Fortified Village, he guaranteed also that he'd have green mana and be able to cast his Thraven Inspector on turn one. So he's done that. He's generated the clue and passed the turn back to Marcio, who is just going to play a Lumbering Fall, so a little bit slower of a start here for Carvalho this yeah. time. And this is a, a big tell for BBD. If Marcio had Lumbering Falls in his opening hand, clearly he would have played it turn one over Plants. So Marcio drew a tap land on turn two, and then had the decision between playing this land not tapped on turn two, and then having a third untapped land, or just going island selfless spirit, but maybe not having three mana on turn three. And Marcio took the, the more conservative line, because if he goes island uh, selfless spirit, he could just draw another untapped land and just kind of have his cake and eat it too. But instead, he decides to take the safe line of making sure he has three on turn three, which is much more important in this matchup. 
Absolutely, especially only facing down one power here. It's not, he, he does have the luxury of a little bit of time to take that conservative route. So now we're going to see a dust squad for Cruder for Brian Brown doing. Uh, three. And he's going to pass the turn back to Marcio Carvalho, who does have an island in hand. You can see that here, and he's going to be able to get on the board now with a reflector mage on the dust squad for Cruder before passing the turn back to Brian. And, and Brian's played a turn behind curve uh, uh, every turn so far, because he played tap land turn one, one drop turn two, two drop on turn three. But this is the turn where he is going to be able to spend four mana if he, if he wants to. Doesn't look like he has anything to spend four mana on particularly, but he does have something to find, spend three mana on, which is Reflector Mage, your Reflector Mage, and get in there with the Thraben Inspector. The Thraben Inspector doesn't look super impressive quite yet, but you mentioned Thalia's Lieutenant earlier, which is the type of card that can really change the way this matchup works. And, you know, even a, a lowly little card like a Thraben Inspector can become a threat. And, and Brian is doing his best to stay ahead on board because he, he knows Marcio has a bunch of spell colors in his deck. It actually turns out Marcio has three in his hand. And by playing Reflector Mage, even on a Reflector Mage, which is not generally the target you want, Brian Duan is able to make sure that Marcio doesn't have a great avenue to, to play these spell colors. Pretty big draw there for, for Brian Brian Duan as well. He picked up a collected company. Okay, one of the best top decks he could find. So when your opponent, like Marcio just did, passes with Combat. seven cards in hand and four mana, th there is not that many cards they could have that are relevant right here. Collected Company and Spellcaller are just the two main ones that have oh, to well. leap out for, for BBD. <laughs> BBD is just going to attack anyway, and Marcio says, no, okay, no blocks. And BBD says, sure, take three, I'll pass the turn back. I'm the one who has Collected Company at the ready. And here's where Marcio is, is just great not, for Brian, right? Yeah, Marcio's not in the spot he likes, because if Marcio had Collected Company, this would be pretty good for him. He'd be able to company at a turn. That's okay. kind of the dream. But right. instead, he's probably going to you know, have to think about firing off one of these spell colors because he just has so many in hand. And he's, if he spends turn four playing nothing, then he's going to kind of lose four mana for the rest of the game. Like he's not, he will not have spent that mana. And this isn't a game where yeah. he's going to have you know, tons and tons of excess mana. Are we going to see uh, Brian respond to the spell queller? Or not respond to it, but still cast it on end step here? Or... Is he going to allow Marcio to untap? I think there's a pretty good uh, chance that, that resolves, BBD casts company once uh, right, right now. Pass company. Yeah, okay, so he's going to let the triggers resolve, and this ensures that Brian resolves his collected company. The timing of it isn't as important as the assurance that it actually resolves, uh, and hello, uh, Thalia's four. lieutenant and a reflector well, mage. What a beating. And that's part of the reason BBD wanted the quality to resolve. If he hits mage, he gets to bounce the spell caller back. He gets to get three counters off the Thalia's lieutenant. All, all of a sudden... Plus, the, the lieutenant sees the mage because they came into play at the same time. All of a sudden, BBD has 10 power in play and Marcio has zero. Wow, that's insane. Now, Marcio can cast a Spell Queller. He, he is free of that, right? Because that was still right. on Brian's the, the turn. The timing of Reflector Mage is such that Marcio, if he wanted to, could main phase a Spell Queller. But, but at whatever. this point, he's just getting run over. He, Marcio even does have a Reflector Mage, the, the one that got bounced back earlier. But BBD can just trample right over it with just his horde of creatures. Mm -hmm. None of which have actual trample, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Brian has a, uh, a clue token still sitting out there all the way from that turn one inspector. He's going to be able to sacrifice that at some point to make sure that the card draw keeps flowing for him as well. And he could be closing in on the victory thanks to the back of, uh, on the back of these tempo plays. And, you know, the fact that BBD got a clue on turn two and hasn't come close to wanting to crack it, that's a good sign for him. Mm -hmm. It means... Clues are kind of like the, the bottom of the barrel when it comes to things you want to spend your mana on. I mean, they're great. They, they do kind of get you through the game and increase your card flow. But the fact that BBD's had better things to do every turn is a good sign. We saw him lose last game when he was kind of cracking clues while under pressure, which is not where you want to be. Okay, it looks like Tireless Tracker was the choice there for, for Carvalho because he also can play Selfless Spirit this turn after making a clue from that land drop before passing the turn back. So he's attempting to get those shields up as well as he can, but unfortunately, his board still just doesn't match up very well against what BBD has, at least at the moment. Looks like Brian also has himself a Dromica's Command in hand, which he can use to uh, try to get in for even more damage this turn. Selfless Spirit makes uh, the timing very important on the command because if BBD fires off, let's say he wanted to fire off command pre-combat and Marcio sacks Selfless Spirit, that would save the tireless tracker if it got targeted and then have an indestructible blocker. So uh -huh. BBD has a pretty high incentive to just attack first, wait for Marcio to use Selfless Spirit, and then maybe use command to, to polish off Marcio's final creature. Okay. Now, what does it look like if Marcio just blocks and 
doesn't use the, the selfless spear. Does he have that option here? Marcio could just put Tracker in front of, like, say, Thali's lieutenant, which is mm -hmm. uh, the, the biggest threat that the Tracker can kill, not block anything with selfless spirit and just pass. But if he does that, BBD gets to hit Marcio for eight and so trade Marcio a 3-3 three, three for like a 3-2. feels like that's two. great, right? Yeah. I, 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 think that, I think that BBD is pretty happy no matter what happens with okay. this outcome. Take everything. And so Marcio is just going to play around it here by just saying, I'm just going to take it all. And, and so the, he just takes right, 11 so take here? 11. The biggest advantage of this is Oof. Selfless Spirit scales really well. When you have a combat involving four creatures, Selfless Spirit is awesome. So Marcio wants to set, a, set up a, a board where he can play a bunch of creatures and then Selfless Spirit to get multiple good interactions. Also, interesting here, Luis, as well, is that Brian played the Duskwatch Recruiter post-combat, which put another counter on the lieutenant, but that might have signaled to Marcio... Uh, you know, about that Dromacus Commander or something. Yeah, Marcio is certainly well aware of what, what Brian could have here, and playing a post-combat Duskwatch recruiter does does kind of tip BBD's hand just a little bit. Especially because he played a pre-combat <laughs> uh, Lamhole Pacifist to get that one counter on it. And, and Marcio is using his life total as a resource very well here. He's playing a matchup where there's no direct damage, so going down to four means that, you know, it gives him the most options for blocking next turn, but I still think that BBD at this point ha is a little too far ahead for Marcio to really have a, a great hope of stabilizing. Also of note here, you can see that Marcio only has the one white source. He's got the planes sitting in there. That could constrict as every single card in his hand does take white mana. It's going to limit him to just one play this turn. And even if that plays a Reflector Mage, which will, you know, of course, get a creature off the board, Marcio still ends up in a situation where he just... Even if he can survive, takes you know a, a number of disadvantageous trades, like the Selfless Spirit basically dies and then takes a little bit of damage, it also hinges on BBD having literal yep. nothing. And it looks like maybe a desperate act here for Marcio Carvalho as he decides to sacrifice that clue to try to find some action. And he's going to lead up, or follow up, excuse me, with that Reflector Mage that we mentioned. He's going to put Thalia's Lieutenant back in the hand. Now, that's not going to be able to be cast next turn, but... Uh, <laughs> If he does get to recast it in two turns, you got to figure that's going to put him in a great position. <laughs> it's as not well. a good long-term plan to, to bounce a, a creature that gives your opponent's entire team plus one plus one, but it is what Marcy needed to do to try, try to claw back into this. And Marcio's wins often come at the back of like spell caller and that lieutenant when it comes down again. BBD unable to attack with Lamholt Pacifist currently because it doesn't have four power, or none of his creatures do, but. Very, very close to, to being able to deal lethal to Marcio. Marcio will fall to two on an attack with everything here and lose a selfless spirit. And the tireless tracker will take out one of the reflector mages, presumably, but. Tremoka's command. Yeah, command. Uh, put a counter on Lamhold Pacifist and Lamhold Pacifist fights selfless spirit. You heard it. And that does two things that are bad for Marcio. It makes Slamhold Pacifist able to attack and removes a blocker. So this is, uh, this is much more than lethal. And this looks like an easy lethal attack here for Brian Brown Dewan, who evens things up at one game apiece in our final match. So we're going to get, well, we're going to get a more traditional look <laughs> at a finals here. A best two out of three match now is going to decide it. And uh, we also get a chance to see how these players sideboard it. So you can see that uh, Brian Brownduin has three copies of Gideon Ally of Zendikar that he can bring in here. And he's got a few two ofs down the line with the days on doing the Nissa, the Declaration, the Negate, and the Tragic Arrogance. What jumps, what jumps off the screen do you hear, Luis? It's kind of funny given the two games we just saw that were just such landslides, but Tragic Arrogance is great when the, when the game stalls out. And a lot of these, these Bant against Bant matchups do end up in board stalls. So Tragic Arrogance has a lot of utility there. Uh, BBD can round out his creature count. Knight of the White Orchid is a card, one of the cards in the format that gives you the most advantage for being on the draw. So BBD, I think, is going to be looking to, to have more knights in his deck on the draw than on the play. And uh, other than that, Declaration of Stone can also help kind of come back when you're, when you're behind and trade a little bit of mana for, for time. Let's take a look at Marcio Carvalho's sideboard here. And uh, what about this one? Uh, very similar, I mean, in the sense that there's Tragic Arrogance and Declaration of Stone. Uh, Dromoka's Command, also a card you, you generally want in the, in the kind of mirror matches. He's kind of hedged and put two in the board and two in the main, but he'll probably go to the full four here, you, you anticipate? Uh, there's a good chance of that, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
basically you can't clutter your deck up with too many non-collected company hits. And Marcio's already running a little bit low on those. He started with 24. But you do have room for some, and Dramoka's command uh, does help. One one reason to, to maybe not bring in all the commands is that Brian Brown Newton does not have spell color, and that's one of the most important cards to kill with Dramoka's command. So, you know, the fact that instead of spell color, he has cards like Lamphold Pacifist, which is a little beefier than what Marcio has, yeah. means that Dramoka's command loses some luster, though. Yeah. I, I would still expect both players to have some number of tragic arrogance in, in their sideboards. I was also mistaken. He actually has one in the main and two in the board, right. it looks like. Um, What's the most important card we're going to see come in from these players? Is there any is there any earmark card that it's like, oh, well, he drew Tragic Arrogance, now the game's going to end? Or is it more just incremental? Tragic Arrogance is by far the most powerful card okay. because a good Tragic Arrogance can just be completely devastating to your opponent. But the, the, the matchup doesn't play significantly differently than game one matchups. Okay. I mean, the, the decks are just so highly optimized around Collected Company and Reflector Mage that that's still going to be the case. Okay. Interestingly here, uh, as we head into the to the three-game match, because Marcio was able to win game one, that means, you know, he lost the second game, but he's going to be on the play here, and if there is a fifth and decider, he'll be on the play for that as well. Depending on how things pan out, Marcio's kind of stole serve, you know, from uh, BBD here. Yeah, breaking serve, re really important in, in the Bant, in the Bant Mirror. Uh, we, we play tested a lot of the Bant Mirror actually heading into the last Pro Tour, and... The, the player on the play, I mean, they, they just get to utilize their Reflector Mages and Spell Colors just much better. When did you fall in love with the deck? <laughs> <laughs> I fell in love with Ben. Uh, I, I would say... Was it the uh, top uh, eight announcement? Or? Yeah. <laughs> Look, the, the fact that you get to just play a, a lot of high-quality cards, uh, mm -hmm. a good, I think actually a surprisingly good mana base, and a deck that plays well from behind or plays well while ahead, and just there, there aren't that many times when, when you end up with a deck like that. The kind of like aggro control deck which Bant falls into, a tempo deck, if you will. The, those, are the, those are the decks that end up being just you know, all-time greats because they just play well from every position, whereas aggro decks sometimes fall behind, and control decks, of course, uh, they're, they're behind almost the whole game until they finally win. Players are still consulting their sideboards here as they set up for what very well could be the most important best two out of three of their professional magic careers. Definitely. I mean... I suspect neither player is really thinking too much about like what the results of the match are. They're just playing their match because that's what you really need to do. You get your heads down, your, your, your headphones on, and <laughs> you get to it. But yeah, this is, I mean, I'd be surprised if this wasn't the most important match that they could, not only of their careers to date, but almost that you can play in general. I mean, this is the finals of the World Championship. There have been fewer World Champions than basically every other high-level accolade in Magic. We just crown one every year. You take a quick look at the trophies behind the players there. There's one for the finals in front and the big one. It actually has the names of every world champion and a plaque around the bottom, so you get your name added to that. Did they use Shahar Shanhar's name there, or did they just put a little two by the, the, the first one? He has two different plaques on there. Take a look at our uh, feature match area here, too. It's just one of the most stunning feature matches we've ever held a Magic tournament in. This is the historic Paramount Theater in downtown Seattle. It's a a very old and uh, has a very rich history behind it, and it is, uh, it's is—it's ornate, and it seems to fit really well with the Kaladesh theme that has been pushed here. Oh, this is an incredible venue. It's, uh, I think, the, the most incredible venue I've ever played a tournament in. Only two players left of the 24 that started our world championship. Brian Brown doing got here through being the GP master. Uh, that, that, that slot takes some dedication. He played at I, a ton of Grand Prix this year. He flew all of the world playing Grand Prix and ended up getting the most points from Grand Prix, uh, narrowly edging out uh, Seth Manfield. It is an interesting spot as well. You know, most of the other ways that you can qualify tend to value peak performance, you know, having really high highs over the long term, to be right. fair, over the, an entire season. But, you know, I heard uh, Brian in an interview before the tournament start, he said, I'm representing the grinders here. Like, you know, the people that put their head down and just keep going over and over and over and really just, you know, pounding out those small edges. And, uh, you know, he was one of the few gold players. There's only two of them. The, here the they finals. are. <laughs> <laughs> They're both here. Uh, Marcio on the other side of the table was our draft master, which meant he accrued more pro points at the Pro Tour via the limited portion than anybody else. And he did it running away as well. And that secured his seat. And now he's facing down Brian Brown Dew and see who's going to be our champion. Looks like so, solid hands for both players here. That's what I want to hear. I, I want to see some good games. 
The first couple of games were a little lopsided, one in each direction, but uh, let's see how these go here as Marcio Carvalho leads things off with a fortified village before passing the turn back to Brian Brown Doohan. And Brian it's has been... Knight of the White Orchid in his hand, uh, actually two copies, which really the card you want to see on the draw, it, it just gives you a, a two minute two two that gives you a land is, you know, especially with first strike and it still is a human for lieutenant. Like, you know, you don't, you don't get that card for free. And, and the fact that being on the draw gives you access to that card. Wow. It's, it's a powerful argument for Brian playing well, even while going second. Whereas Marcio's deck, you know, really wants to go first. Really good start for Brown doing here as well. You see he's got a Lamhole Pacifist that's going to hold back any attacks, at least currently, from that Duskwatch recruiter and kind of already force the issue onto Carvalho if he wants to be the one to do the get-ahead, stay-ahead plan. And Carvalho looking at a Nyssa Vastwood Seer as his three-drop for the turn. Otherwise, he's got some lands in hand. Yeah, and, and Marcio's got... You know, one of the drawbacks of this of this particular matchup is Marcia's Dromoka's commands. They have trouble with some of Ryan Brad Doohan's creatures. This is a perfect example, right? If he was to use the Dromoka's command on either creature, it would just end up trading for the Lambhole Pacifist. Yeah, and it's certainly not what Marcio is interested right. in doing. I, this is a fine play. Marcio gets to spend three mana on turn three, but you know, in this scenario, he doesn't really need the forest. He still has you know multiple other lands in hand, and this is a, a far ways away from flipping. Marcia needs seven lands in play before she flips, so. This is not really what Marcio is excited about playing, but his other option, using Duskwatch Recruiter, the downside there is that would let Brian Brown do and flip his Lambhold Pacifist into a Lambhold Butcher, and that, that would, then it would just start trucking. All right, and here's the, uh, the play that you mentioned uh, in the opener there, Luis. He's got the Knight of the White Orchid, which he's going to get value out of here by, well, in this case, not only ramping, but also fixing his mana, and he still has a land drop to play here as well. Yeah, getting the fact that Knight can get Prairie Stream or Canopy Vista is just such a huge boon. It means that this three-color deck can play double white cards and still play cards of the other two colors yeah, with relative ease. Yeah, you see he plays an Evolving Wilds after that, and now all of a sudden, Brian Brown doing a, on the draw is ahead on mana with four lands on the battlefield versus Carvalho's three. A really important draw there for Marcio. He, he did draw Sylvan Advocate, so... He's going to be able, if he would like, to set up a Dromoko's command and, like, he could pl like play Advocate and immediately put a plus plus one counter on it, fight the Lambhold Pacifist. The problem with that is, Knight of the White Recruiter has first strike, oh, so yeah. that it's holding off Duskwatch Recruiter and Nissa. It's really hard for Marcio to get damage through, and of these two decks, Marcio's deck is a lot more suited for for pushing the lead because he's got cards like Spellcaller, you know, whereas. Brian's late game is better with Thali's Lieutenant. Take a look at Brian's late game uh, right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little one-sided, but it's triple Reflector Mage to go with that second Knight of the White Orchid in hand. And that can be the type of draw that, you know, if you're not going to draw your collected companies, that you can just keep your opponent off balance over and over and over again. And I think Marcio is going to be well-suited to getting that Lamholt Pacifist off the battlefield right now if he can. And one reason to do this immediately, too, is just play it around your opponent having instance. Things go really poorly if they respond to your <laughs> command. Mm -hmm. So be playing it now makes things much safer. But like you mentioned a second ago, Luis, that Knight of the White Orchid just holding down the fort and keeping Brian Brown doing at a healthy 20 life as Carvalho tries to position himself to be able to start attacking for damage and has yet to be able to do so. Reflector Mage is going to make that more difficult. Uh, Reflector Mage bouncing, say, Sylvan Advocate, get, you know, gets rid of that plus one, plus one counter. Though, we're, with neither player drawing company or really, you know, making any headway, both players are at 20 life. Marcio's Duskwatch Lieutenant and Nissa both start, or Duskwatch Recruiter, rather, both start kind of pressuring BBD because they draw Marcio a bunch of cards if it takes too long. Mm -hmm. Brian with that triple Reflector Mage, Knight of the White Orchid, and has found a land for the turn off the top of the library here is going to start trying to leverage these. But, you know, you, you just mentioned the word Lieutenant, and uh, that is a card he'd love to see after the <laughs> dust settles on all these reflector L majors, Lieutenants right? on the mind. Uh, Brandon actually has an interesting decision here. He could have not played a land in the hope that Marcia would, and then he'd enable his knight in the next turn. But because Brandon has plenty of lands in, in hand, he's not really as worried, and he, I think he'd rather just get the second knight out as soon as possible. Yeah, also, this still sets him up, right? Does he, yeah, he has another land in hand, so he actually is set up to play double Reflector Mage next turn, potentially just wipe the board of any creatures on uh, Marcio Carvalho's side. Yeah, I like this really aggressive play by Brandon. Yeah. 
when you have Trouble Reflector Mage and you don't have something like Company, when your opponent has a Duskwatch and a Nissa uh, that will draw them cards in the late game, really trying to put as many creatures into play it, as possible is, is how you're going to win the game. Right on time, though. Collected Company off the top of the library there from Marcio Carvalho, and that could be what he needs to stave off this Reflector Mage onslaught. Yeah, I, that, that, that is exactly the card Marcio's hoping to draw. It gives him not only card advantage, but you know, a, a, a significant board presence. So Marcio now has to decide, does he want to play it now and not run the risk of maybe BBD boarding in a card like Negate? Or does he want to wait and try to ambush BBD? Another advantage to waiting is that the Duskwatch Recruiter would flip, and having a, having a flip Duskwatch Recruiter would make it so that uh, BBD would have to do something to that 3-3 before he could even attack, tapping him at, down a little lower and making company even better. So Marcio is going to pass the turn back, which is going to transform his Duskwatch recruiter. He's now crawling hard howler, and Brian is going to have his way with this board thanks to these reflector mages, unless Marcio can interact with that collected company in some way. Well, there are some ways this turns out well for Brian. Uh, there are, of course, some ways it turns out poorly. Uh, one is that he's going to start by Reflector Maging, or attempting to, the Crowl and Horde Howler. Mm -hmm. And Marcio has incentive to now cast Company to try to hit Spellcaller. If Marcio does and Spellcaller is the mage, Brian Brandu can follow up with the third Reflector Mage, <laughs> bouncing the Spellcaller, putting the Reflector Mage back on the stack, bouncing the Crowl and Horde Howler, and maybe getting to get in for some damage. Let's find out. Is Marcio going to pull the trigger on the uh, Collected Company right now? Three cards in hand for Brian Brown Doohan. He's got a couple of lands and that third Reflector Mage that we mentioned. He has ran out of gas beyond that, so this is a huge sequence here for this match. There's a Reflector Mage. He hit two Reflector Mages. And so far a tireless tracker. That's so. right, so those are his options. So certainly we're seeing, going to see a Reflector Mage presumably bouncing... Well, it could bounce either Knight or Reflector Mage. Given that Marcio has decent blocks here, he may just want to bounce a Knight because he doesn't want to have to deal with a recast Reflector Mage. And then Marcio has the decision, do you want to get the Tracker for incremental card advantage or do you want to get Reflector Mage to try to stabilize the board better? Marcio's not under that much pressure once this Reflector Mage resolves, so I would, yeah, I would be surprised if he did not want to get a put a tireless Tracker into play. Yeah, he does exactly that. There's a the Reflector Mage. So remember, Brian Brown Dewan still has a Reflector Mage on the stack. Marcio doesn't know what it's targeting. And now Marcio gets to Reflector Mage, one of Brian Brown Dewan's creatures. And he only has two choices, either a Knight of the White Orchid or the other Reflector Mage. So it looks like he's going to hit the Knight of the White Orchid. Now Reflector Mage resolves. Um, and then a trigger's going to happen, and he can return. Well, we were thinking yeah, the Colin Hard Howler before. And then and initially that was the most appealing target, but now that... Brian Brown Doohan can't attack past a Reflector Mage even, then, yeah, bouncing the Tireless Tracker stops Marcio from drawing cards for at least a turn. Now does Brian cast the second Reflector Mage, the last one from his hand? If he were, if he were to do that, he still just wouldn't have an attack here. Mm -hmm. So Brian Brown Doohan is in a kind of tough spot. He, he's got all these Reflector Mages, but the fact that he's using Reflector Mages then not getting damage in oh, means that eventually that he just is going to run out of steam. One spell only, right? Yes, just the Mage. Players confirming that Crown and Horde Howler uh, continues to howl. That's right, and the uh, BBD has declined to play a land and did not play a spell, just passed the turn back. With that Knight of the White Orchid in his hand, as well as a Reflector Mage and a pair of planes. Wants to try to get a little value, perhaps. If Marcio plays a land, his Knight of the White Orchid will produce an extra land for him, though Marcio knows about this. Well, he's going to let him have it. Given the Nissa in play, Marcia really has an incentive to keep playing lands. Once he hits that seventh land, remember on turn three that Nissa didn't look that impressive? You know, t turn six rolls around, turn seven rolls around, all of a sudden Nissa starts becoming a threat, and Marcio has right now the long term advantage uh, Ooh, given the cards on board. I do believe that was a collected company now off the top for Brian Brown doing. Try to get a better look at it. I couldn't quite see. It was. It was a collected company. Oh, this is a real duel here. We've got. <laughs> couple of top decks after some decent starts from both players here. And there's that Knight of the White Orchid. 
and then the, that's the, that's Brian Brown doing playing it, and then Marcio was like, "Well, can you? Yeah, yeah, you can because that all happened on Brian's end step." So instant speed reflector mages can lead to a uh, slightly confusing timing. That's right. And because Marcio did play that land, you know, hoping to get uh, land off the top here to transform Nissa next turn, that means that Brian's going to get some value, go get a planes. And now given that Brian really only has one Reflector Mage left to hit Pass. and potentially some Thalia's Lieutenants, he's not as much looking to company right away and try to push through attacks, especially into a bunch of untapped mana where Marcio could have something like Spellcaller or company into another Spellcaller. As it turns out, that's not what Marcio has. Any cards? No, Marcio's about to have is a lot uh, of cards. Three. He's he's entering the, the phase of the game where Bant Company just starts drawing tons of cards. It's part of the reason this deck is so strong. That's right. He can pay sure. two mana here for the Tireless Tracker. And now he's drawn a land off the top uh, of his library, which is exactly what he needed to make a clue token and transform Nissa. And like you uh, said, this is going to get out of hand very quickly. But Brian is actually going to respond to Nissa's trigger, try to hit that last Reflector Mage here before she transforms into a Planeswalker. Let's see if he can hit it. Well, he hit a Thalia's Lieutenant and a Tireless Tracker of his own. So a powerful, a, a pair of powerful cards for him. Is it going to be enough? Yeah, Thalia's Lieutenant represents seven points of power total. And so, you know, it's clearly a great card, but the fact that Marcia's about to flip Nyssa, about to get a clue off Tireless Tracker, Marcia's going to be up a lot of cards, and you know Marcia's got lurking in his hand Archangel Avacyn. Oh, jeez. Yeah, the one of Archangel Avacyn, hugely powerful on a board state like this. Two cards in hand for Brian Brown doing. One of them then is a Reflector Mage, the other is a Planes. Marcin now has to decide whether he wants to plus Nissa, try to draw an extra card, maybe put a land into play, or minus Nissa and summon a Shia, a 4 4 Trampler. Looks like he's decided to make an Ashaya token here to give himself a 4 4, full, further bolster his board. So, BBD drawing a land here means that he's not got. He's got the tireless tracker, so he can start making clues, but. But he doesn't have the engines that Marcio has, something like, uh, you know, potentially that Dusk Watch next turn or the fact that Nissa's get game Marcio incremental advantage every turn. Could not quite see what he found there. Looked like a Tamio to me. And it did to me, too. He actually has two of those in his deck. It was. It was a Tamio field researcher. What does this change? This board has gotten very, very oh, bogged this, down. This, this is one of the stalled boards that that I was mentioning, where both players are just good at, you know, two threes are great at blocking. They're not as good at attacking. And the, the fact that Tamio is very, very powerful, but tapping down two creatures doesn't necessarily give BBD a great attack. Plusing Tamio could let BBD attack with some of his creatures and draw cards, but Marcio is just going to have good blocks. So this is going to be tough. and. Unfortunately for BBD, that, that Archangel Avacyn, I think, is just going to do so much damage this game. Oh, uh, plus Tamiyo on... And a plus on Sylvan Advocate and Ashaya. Okay, so you see an interesting play that you can make with Tamiyo here. He's decided to plus Tamiyo targeting two of Marcio's creatures. And then he's going to go to combat. So if Ashaya or Sylvan Advocate end up dealing uh, damage, then BBD will draw a card for each one. It's a disincentive for Marcio to block. Also lasts until BBD's next turn. So it prevents Marcio from getting attacks in. And again, when neither player is making attacks, they both have to kind of size up, like, who's winning this game? Who's getting, who's getting advantage every turn? 
there's a tireless tracker on each side that don't seem to like they're running out of gas. Uh, they, there's now a planeswalker on each side, so it's not quite as clear cut. And to some degree, I, you know, Marcio ha has to wish that Carlin Horde Howler was just a Duskwatch recruiter instead. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, so Brian passed the turn back to Marcio, and Marcio said, all right, well, Archangel Avison then. But Archangel Avison opens up some very interesting possibilities for, for Marcio. Drumoka's command offers the ability for Marcio to get one of his creatures into a fight that it dies in, which will then trigger Avison on the next upkeep. So Avison could flip. The problem with that is <laughs> Avison flipping is just going to nuke both sides. It's going to be do a lot of damage. I well, would just leave a Reflector Mage on the other side for Brian. So here, the fact that Marcio didn't hit a land on that Nissa plus one it's not something he's very happy about. This is the stage of the game also where Ban wants to play land every turn, up to turn 15. It's just the tireless tracker gives you such an incentive to keep playing lands. Yeah, he's got two of them on the battlefield here as well, so he really would have liked to see a land there. Well, Marcio still has that clue if he, if he wants to see what his top card is. And that would give him another shot at a land. And if he could play, that, play a land there, getting two more clues. I mean, Tardis Tracker is an engine that fuels itself, right? Mm -hmm. you see, every land you get gets you another clue, and every clue gives you more shots at more land. So thinking about what he wants to draw here, what's the most important thing before he uh, sacrifices the clue? He's being very careful about which mana he's tapping. And it's going to be clear. Not only does he have to think about what spells are in his hand, he has to think about what spells are he, he could potentially draw. And the mana requirements in these decks are not simple. What did he hit? Another Duskwatch Recruiter. Jeez. That, and that was not the time for that. Like, missing this land, it, it's funny, you might think, oh, well, Marcio has seven lands in player ID and a bunch of cards. Like, yeah, drawing a spell is fine. But missing his land is not only missing a land drop, it's missing essentially two spell draws off of, or two draws at spells off of those two clues. And because it spirals for more, you, you're missing, fu you know, just future mana, future clues. Like, it, it was actually really bad for Marcio that he didn't hit a land there. He was really hoping to draw a land. Archangel Avison is going to attack Tamiyo Field Researcher for four and drop the loyalty down to one on that Planeswalker. And Brian Brown doing just drew a collected company. Both players are, are they are actually collecting they companies at a pretty fast hitting. clip. <laughs> yes. But... This isn't a game like the previous two games where one collected company can just completely turn the tide. I mean, it's great to draw a collected company. It's one of your better cards right now. But e even the, the best company hit isn't, isn't going to make it so BBD goes from, you know, having a relatively stall board to, to crushing. Double Follies Lieutenant could, could do some damage, though. And there it is. He's going to put collected company on the stack right now, and Marshall can do nothing. Let's see what Brian hits. Wow, he had only a tireless tracker there. Not great. Tardis Tracker is a powerful card, but Marcio has to be happy about this development. Yeah, he didn't want to see another Thalia's Lieutenant or something along those lines. We did see uh, one of the tragic arrogances that you, man you mentioned uh, when we were talking about the sideboards got put in that bottom five as well. Yeah, and tragic arrogance for either player would be pretty solid. It is a symmetrical effect, and on a board like this, it's going to cause a lot of creatures on both sides to go to the graveyard, so it's not... It's not the same as, you know, some matchups where Tragic Arrogance is just completely brutal, but it still be, would be very good for either player. It looks like Brian wants to sacrifice a clue on his turn as well. And Brian has to worry about that Avacyn. All other abilities aside, Avacyn being a 4-4 Flying Vigilance, a Sarah Angel is just being good this game. All right, it's Reflector Mage here for Brian, Brian yeah, Brown Dillon. And Avison is going to go back into hand here for Carvalho. What does Brian have lined up here? Attacks? If Brian wants to push an attack, he can plus one Tamiyo and maybe attack with some creatures that uh, would draw him some cards. But the fact that a Shy is a 4-4, four, four, Sylvan Ivan gets a 4-5, those trackers are 4 threes. It means that there aren't that many creatures BBD can really even think of sending with, especially since, again, both players' life totals are so high that if BBD makes too reckless of an attack, Marcio can just take a bunch of damage, make only optimal blocks, you know, advantageous ones, and then just pass the, send the turn back with all his creatures attacking. Plus Tamiyo on Tireless Tracker and Ashaya. So he's plus Tamiyo on his own tireless tracker and his opponent's Ashaya. 
So the cool thing about basically this... Basically his biggest creature and his opponent's biggest creature. Is that BBD can send in Tireless Tracker, and he's going to get a card no matter, no matter what here. If Marcio doesn't block, Nissa dies, and BBD draws a card. If Marcio does block, then BBD draws a card off Tracker, and because it's a 5-4, it can kill any of the creatures Marcio would put in front of it. Also, it's threatening to be a 6-5, by the way. There's these two clues like kind of lurking off to the side, and the mystery they'll unravel is why Tireless Tracker went from a 5-4 to a 6-5. Brian has also left up mana for Dromica's Command. Though he doesn't have any cards left in his hand, does he? I think he's out. No, the Tireless Trackers have forced BBD to play out his ah, lands pre-combat. Okay. So and Marcio does have perfect information here then. As long as he remembers about the clue up there, he will know exactly what he needs to do and what he wants to trade off. Marcio does have Dromica's Command, so... Possible he could uh, engineer a situation as well. Uh, order the Sylvan Advocate first. Yep, damage. I draw a card. Hey, so this worked out pretty well for Brian Brown doing. He traded off his tireless tracker for a Sylvan Advocate, a reasonable trade on the other side, and he also got to draw a card off of it. I'll pass the turn. And he's going to pass the turn back. I cast Tomio and Reflector. Or no, I cast Collected Company and Reflector. So Brian reminding Marcio that his uh, Duskwatch recruiter should be back on front side duty there. Sure. There's Those that Those tireless land. trackers just keep rolling right along here for Marcio Carvalho. He couldn't find one after a couple of looks last time, but now he had two in a row. And now Marcio's in a situation where he's really not going to run out of clues. Like, I mean, yes, eventually he may crack all four of these clues and want some more, but once you've snowballed with double tracker, you end up with a bunch of excess clues in play. Though, funnily enough, Tragic Arrogance will wipe out the clues as oh, well. Oh, that's true. Uh, but now it just means because he didn't play a land last turn, then he's forever down a land. But Nissa has a good way of catching him back up. Now both players are, are sitting on nine lands. So Marcio does have Avacyn. Both players are aware of that. Marcio can't cast uh, Avacyn this turn, but he will be able to cast it during Brian Brown Doohan's next turn, thanks to it having Flash and Reflector right? Mage not locking yes. it out completely. 20. Brian Brown Doohan has found himself a copy of Nissa Vastwood Seer there. He didn't have quite enough mana to cast it last turn. Time, yeah. So both of the tireless trackers are going to attack Tomio. Technically, those could grow as large as 8-7 if Marcio just went, you know, full-on, like, you know, detective mode and cracked all the clues. But <laughs> Brian is probably assuming they're not going to be quite that big, but he still has to respect the fact that Marcio can just crack a clue or two and, be, and have them be a little bit larger. Marcio also has that Dromoka's command, which is, at, at some point, you know, he's going to be able to cast it for good effect. One option Brian has as well is he could just let Tamio die. The fact that Marcia is attacking with a lot of power, Four it's not the, the, the end of the world to, to let your Planeswalker go to the graveyard. So Brian wanted to have more information about what was going to happen going forward, so he decided to sacrifice the clue there. He found a Dromica's command, but... Go ahead, declare blocks. Sure. Um, reflector Mage, blocks one. Looks like he's going to chump block one of them, and he's going to stack block on the other to try to make sure that it dies, or at least force Marcio to do a bunch of things. So if Marcio wants to kill two of Brian's creatures here on the triple block, he would have to sacrifice three clues. As is, Marcio can kill the Reflector Mage getting blocked by the 4-3, or the 4-3 Tracker getting blocked by the 2-3 Reflector Mage. That just, Marcio just wins that combat. The 4 3 tracker can take out either a mage or a Knight of the White Orchid. And, and again, Marcio has the option of spending six mana right now to take out another one, but that, that is less appealing. Marcio also has that command in hand, so he, he's, he, he can do something like have you know, a Shia take out one of the 3 4 reflector mages, put a counter on tracker. So Marcio will have a 4 toughness tracker, which is currently taking six damage, then he gets to sack three clues. So 
Yeah, Marcio can make it so both of his tireless trackers live through this combat. It'll basically tap him out, though. And BBD then potentially has the openings to attack with his final three creatures. It also will kill three of BBD's creatures if Marcio does, you know, just basically move all in here by sacrificing three clues and then using uh, Jamoka's command plus a fight to, to remove one of BBD's blockers. Marcio kind of running through all this as well. That's right. This is an incredibly complex board state that we've found here. And a very complex combat step. And of course, these players have been competing in the World Championship for multiple days in a row. We started off with draft, constructed, draft and constructed, then draft, then constructed on three days in a row. And uh, this is Brian asking that Marcio order the blockers. This is, of course, the first thing that needs to happen after blocks are declared. First, second, third. So the mages, both mages first? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, if that's an absolute. He, that he can't do that, can he? I cannot. I, I think that that got Reflector Mage last turn. Did it not? It has been a very tough game to track, but... Yeah. Oh. He, it must not have then. Um, no, BBD cast Reflector Mage last turn. I thought he did. He did. He, he target, cast Collective Company, he, yeah, he and targeted Reflector Mage. When was it bounced with Reflector Mage? Two turns ago, right? Multiple turns ago. Yeah, yeah he can recast yeah. it. Yeah. Multiple turns ago, I think, right? Yeah. Oh, wait. No. Wait, Tamio got attacked from five. I actually think that's true, yeah. Tamio got attacked from five to one by Avacyn. Okay. BBD then played Reflector Mage bouncing Avacyn and yeah, ticked Tamio up to two. Last turn. Because I bounced with an attack with a tracker. You, so you, you can't cast, cast it until much. Yeah, you ca cast Collected Company and got a Mage. You sure? Of, no, he just he, he cast it from his hand. He got a Mage off of it. No, I didn't. I got, I got a tracker off the company and then I cast a Reflector Mage from my hand on Avacyn and then I attacked with this tracker at Nissa. Yeah, Marcio cannot cast so, that Avacyn yeah, actually, this it, it turn. It actually can't be cast until my turn. Okay. That's right, yes. Can we, can we hold? They're, they're going to check the replay. They're going to double check the video. Okay. So we'll pause for that. I'm fairly certain that's the case. Well, Avacyn or not, this is still a very interesting combat step. Yes, <laughs> and I was, I was, you know, trying to get out of the way to let the, the discussion happen there just to make sure that we're as clear as possible on what's happening, and that is the dispute there is whether or not Marcio has the ability to cast Archangel Avacyn here. By our recollection, he does not. They're going to double check. Uh, not, not something that we normally have a chance to do, but here at the World Championship, we do have a, a little setup. So. He cannot cast it. And you hear the judge saying he cannot cast it. So th despite this being a pretty complicated uh, set of blocks here, Marcio, Marcio now had this plan, and he actually has to recalibrate because I mean, clearly he thought he could cast Avacyn, and yeah. that's what he kind of made these decisions. I did want to ask those. you: Does that change the order of the blockers at all? I don't know I, if I that was part of the it, equation. I, I don't okay. believe it does because Reflector Mage is slightly better to to, okay. to kill. But basically, Marcio has to decide whether he's fine trading the you know the bigger tireless or one okay. of the tireless trackers for just a Reflector Mage, or he wants to just completely move in, yeah. use command, sack all his clues, and just take everything out because. The kind of middle ground of just sacrificing some clues to take out two of those blockers, it's certainly an option, but it is less appealing than trying to go the whole distance and having your tracker survive. If he does go the whole distance, will he be able to kill all three creatures? That's four, eight, that's 11 toughness he needs to come up with, is that right? So, Mars has already sacrificed one clue. Tracker's currently a 5-4. If he okay. sacrifices two more clues, becomes a 7-6, mm -hmm. and then he's able to cast Dromoka's command, to having a Shia him. fight the, one of the Reflector Mages, Kay. putting another counter on Tracker, making it an 8-7, and then that takes out the other two blockers. Okay. He did not do that, though, did he? It, no. It would have required him to tap out, but yes. that was his other option. Okay. But he did actually end up taking he a little did, bit more of that middle ground that you said. You, yeah, you, you played a land. You played a land. You played a land. You plus missed okay, okay. No, 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 no. I'm just explaining. Marcio is asking if he had played a land yet for the turn, and the answer seems to be yes. Yeah, two lands actually entered the battlefield this turn because of uh, Nissa's plus one hit a Yavimaya coast. That's right. 
And one of the reasons that to, 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 to crack that one clue that Marcio did, even though that didn't change the combat, is just to give more information. We saw BBD do that last turn, crack a clue before blocks, just to kind of see what else you want to use your mana for. And with so, seven mana, Marcy is leaving up the ability to, to cast Avacyn and still crack a clue. Now Marcy is asking if he's cast a spell for the turn to and see if his Duskwatch Retruder is going to transform, and the answer was ultimately no. He did use up a little bit of mana and a Planeswalker activation, but didn't actually cast a spell, it seems. A spell was put on the stack, but ultimately that did not happen. That's right. Okay, so Crawlinhorn Howler, and now here's Nissa. Good. And uh, Marcio gives him the, the hand gesture that says, yes, you did make a Nissa. And that means that Brian gets, gets to search up the forest here, play it, and transform his own Nissa. So this yeah. incredible <laughs> grind fest will continue. I'm not going to lie. I love games like this. <laughs> this, is, this, this is where you come magic. alive. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, both these players, like, they're, they're getting to play, like, a very complicated but ultimately satisfying game uh, that... There's something to be said for the, the tempo games that we saw in the first two, but this is a, this is a game where both players just make a ton of decisions. Mm -hmm. So Brian's actually going to play a fortified village there, revealing the forest that he got. That's going to get a counter on Tireless Tracker, and he is going to transform Nissa. He's going to plus Nissa and find a Dromica's Command. That will join the other Dromica's Command that he already had in his hand. Can he line up something here? Remember, now... Uh, all right, he's going to start cracking clues. Let's see what, what he finds. So a really important interaction that both players are going to need to keep in mind here is that BBD knows that Marcio has Avacyn. Marcio yes. knows that BBD has Dromoka's Command. Mm -hmm. Dromoka's Command is a great answer to Avacyn. BBD needs to keep oh. up mana to kill the Avacyn before anything happens. But Marcio also knows that. So both players are aware of all this and have to play around it. But the cool part is, is that BBD has two now. Right. The second huh. Dromoka's Command is is something Marcio doesn't know about and could get completely destroyed by. However, Marcio also has his own commands. So there's a lot of ways this could play out, and it's going to be really interesting to see which direction it goes. On top of all that, that last clue that was sacrificed for Brian Brown Dewan found him a copy of Thalia's Lieutenant. That's a very impactful card at this stage in the game. Yeah, another way he can start to try to take over here. He doesn't have quite enough mana at the moment. Remember, he's already played his land for the turn to play both commands and Athalia's Lieutenant this turn. He can play any two of them, though. I'm going to bust Tamiya. Uh, I'm going to target uh, your Tireless Tracker and your Ashaya. And I'm going to go to combat. Okay, you saw it. You could hear Brian. I'm kind of letting him take some of the commentary duty here as a... Uh, He's being very clear about his actions. Tomio was plussed there. On Tireless Tracker and, and Ashaya. Uh, and on, on the Ashaya as well. And now Brian wants to go to attacks. He has left up mana for both Dromica's commands. And Marcio's thinking. And, and this is a situation where the player that blinks first can very easily get punished. You want your Dromoka's Command to be the last yeah, one on the stack. Because <laughs> in, in the wrong order, things do not go well for you. I mean, fight is an awesome mechanic. It's actually a great way for green to, to deal with opposing creatures. But when it goes poorly, it goes really poorly. That's right. When your 3-3 three, three fights their 2-3, you know, then all of a sudden they get to put a plus-plus one counter on it. They're, now all of a sudden your 3-3 three, three just eats it up against their 3-4, and they get another you know, fight somewhere else. Okay, it, it comes into play with the trigger on the stack. Um, Uh-oh. This is not good news for Brian Brown doing, is it? Uh, I, I think it is, actually. I think the second oh. Dromoka's command is going to work out quite well for Brian Brown doing here because Marcia knows about the one. So, so Marcia was the first one to blink by playing Archangel Avacyn in this right. scenario? Yeah, oh. Uh, put a counter on Reflector Mage, and uh, Reflector Mage fights Avacyn. Now, this could prompt Marcio Carvalho to play his own copy of Dromica's Command. Because if BBD doesn't have a second command, this is so advantageous for Marcio. If Marcio just lets this happen, he traded Avacyn for a command, and BBD got just a counter out of it, which is... <sighs> what not, a disaster. Not, not a great deal for Marcio. Yeah. Avacyn's one of the most important cards. But if Marcio casts uh, his own command here, like, let's say Marcio says, okay, 
my 4-4 or my 5-4 fights your reflector mage in response. BBD can then have one of his other creatures fight that creature, and then all of a sudden Marcio loses two creatures and a command. BBD loses just the two commands, and BBD gets two plus plus one counters out of the deal. There are certainly ways for this to go differently than that, but uh, that, that, that's kind of at the base level, what you're looking to. They're both players are trying to use command to make the fights swing in their favor. So let's see what Marcio does here. Here it's coming. And there it is, Dromica's command from Marcio Carvalho. He has not named his modes yet. Let's just say BBD won't be sacrificing an enchantment. <laughs> I can feel like Marcio doesn't have a good feeling about this. Like he, He's very hesitant to make this BBD play. was pretty confident with how this worked out, and Marcio just knows this can go wrong very easily. I, I think he's forced to fight over this Avacyn, given that it's already in play, but... Counter on Avacyn. Counter on Avacyn. doing, ready to spring his trap once Marcio decides exactly what he wants to do with his own Dromica's command. Though by splitting up what gets the counter and what fights, Marcio is able to and put himself in a position where maybe Brian doesn't get to keep both of his creatures. Like, there's, there's a lot of ways for this to go where Brian does lose a creature. We'll fight Nightwise or Okay, in response to that... And here it goes from Brian Brown doing. Counter on Avacyn and Tracker fights Knight. All right, in response to that, I'm going to do uh, Dramoka's command. Uh, counter on Reflector Mage and Thalia's Lieutenant fights <laughs> There is just like a string of fights and counters happening here. Yeah, but... So, you're doing? Sorry. A counter on Reflector Mage okay. and Thalia's Lieutenant fights Tyler's Tracker. So this is a trade. BBD is going to be losing the, the Thalia's Lieutenant. Yes, but he seems like he was Medieval content trading. with that because it was a tireless tracker that it was right. trading with. And now his resolves, and there's nothing to fight, so it's just a counter. And now the Reflector Mage picks up a counter and fights Avacyn. Yep. That was all with Avacyn's triggered ability on the stack, so that ended up working out very well. For, for Brian Brown doing, just as you described, Luis, it was actually Marcio who blinked first in that transaction, and the second copy of Dramacus Command was a big deal. Yeah, this board stall is, well, it, it's becoming less stalled. I mean, Marcio has three creatures in play. He's got a Planeswalker still, but he, he's, he's, he's falling behind, and BBD has two Planeswalkers. BBD has four creatures in play. Also, BBD has Tireless Tracker. My, Marcio's Tireless Trackers are gone. You know, Tell me your target, a Cheyenne. Tracker. Remember, Tamiyo's ability only counts about cares about combat damage, combat. So, so tracker fighting does not trigger Tamiyo. Mm -hmm. How big of a swing was that for Brian? It was, was that a, a was, was that a game ending, you know, p potential, or was that just like another incremental step in a direction? Uh, it was definitely one of the most important sequences of the game because okay. Avicen is just one of the most important cards. Mm -hmm you know, in this matchup, just an unchecked Avacyn is, is, is so huge, and the fact that she can sometimes flip is so huge. The fact that BBD was able to trade Athalia's Lieutenant in two commands for Avacyn Command and Tireless Tracker, plus BBD gets two counters on that Reflector Mage, that's, that's not irrelevant. Mm -hmm. BBD ended up very far ahead in that exchange. Okay. We're going to see a selfless spirit now from Marcio Carvalho. He just found that off of activating his Dustwatch Recruiter. Yeah, but wait, there's more a Sylvan Advocate, and that wasn't the end of it either. Another Duskwatch Recruiter, so a very good turn here, using up almost all of his mana and adding three creatures to the board for Marcio Carvalho before passing it back. Yeah, but BBD, the fact that he's got Dolly's Lieutenant plus Tamiyo means that BBD can set some up some nice combats. The Selfless Spirit goes a long way here. 
Dusk Watch recruiter off of the Nissa activation for Brian Brando and could give him yet another way to start chaining spells into his hand. He still has a clue left over from the tireless tracker as well. He drew a land for the turn, is that right, Luis? Yeah. It, he's got an Evolve in Wilds, actually, which could give him another two clues off of the uh, tireless tracker. <laughs> BBD's not going to miss a land drop this game. You know, yeah. it, you, you can count, if you want to figure out what, what turn it is, you can count the number of lands BBD has in play, plus like the, some various Knight of the White Orchid nonsense. Mm -hmm. Because at this point, between the clues and the Nissas, BBD not only is going to play a land every turn, he when wants to play a land every turn. Okay, Brian says, I'm going to go get a second clue after sacrificing my Evolving Wilds. Yeah, Tireless Tracker, Duskwatch Recruiter, Nissa. It's like purchasing Flood Protection. You, you, there, there's no way to draw too many lands in, in this kind of matchup. How does the game end, though? Like, if both players are just drawing multiple cards per turn and casting very similar creatures, what, what's the game breaker? Big swings, something like Thalia's Lieutenant. Like, if BBD was able to find a second Thalia's Lieutenant and play them both in the same turn, he would almost assuredly have great attacks. Uh, okay. Tragic Arrogance can reset the board state and kind of, you know, get it back to the point where whatever the players have in hand is what matters. Big Duskwatch recruiter fueled turns. If you can, like, start your turn with a Crowlin Horde Howler in play and then play, like, eight mana worth of creatures for four mana, that, that gives you a, a really big edge as well. It, it's funny because it, it, a lot of it just boils down to using your mana efficiently. Like... We've entered the phase in the game where both players have 9, 10, 11 lands, and I would expect both of them to basically use all their lands every turn. I mean, okay. Sometimes you end up with like an odd land on tap, like Marcio did, but that's just because most of your cards cost two, but you're at a, you're at a point where the, there's no reason to, to leave mana on the table. I'm going to plus Tomio on Selfless Spirits and Sylvan Advocate. Sure. I'll pass the turn. going to plus Tomio on uh, Marcio's two best threats and pass the turn back. So players have entered a bit of a holding pattern here as far as attacks go. And this is a big draw step for Carvalho. Finds a land off the top. But as we've mentioned before, he's got two Duskwatch recruiters and a Nissa rolling along. Plus three clues on the battlefield. So he won't be short on cards either. Well, the, you know, those tireless trackers dying actually means Marcio could run out of clues <laughs> this game. It was something <laughs> that didn't seem very likely, but the way things are heading, it, it doesn't it doesn't seem like it's that outside the realm of possibility. He's going to go for a tireless, excuse me, a, a Duskwatch recruiter activation rather than cracking a clue. He finds a reflector mage. He also found a Gideon, but that's going to have to go on the bottom of the library. Reflector Mage at this stage of the game is, is less about tempo and more about doing things like resetting plus blizzard counters, like that, you know, knocking the four off the tireless tracker and a three off the Reflector Mage. Flying is very important in matchups like this as well, and that's one of the, the edges Marcio has, is his deck has a decent amount of flyers in it. BBD just, you know, humans don't fly very easily, so that's right. <laughs> there, aren't, there aren't a whole lot of them with flying. Reflector Mage to do exactly what you just described, Luis, reset that tireless tracker. It's not really a huge setback for Brian Brown doing as far as cards and such, but he did build up four plus one plus one counters on that card, which are going to fly away. One advantage Marcio has when it comes to attacks in this stage of the game is that selfless spirit, you know, that lowly selfless spirit is sitting there, and it means that if there ever is a gigantic combat step, Marcio will lose just selfless spirit. Everything else will be indestructible. There's no, no, nothing else will die. So... Marcio can probably leverage that for at least a creature or two. But remember, that Sylvan Advocate still has been Tamiyot. So if it, if it enters combat, then BBD is likely to draw a card, assuming it ends up dealing damage to something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Selfless Spirit was the other target for that Tamiyo plus ability. We, both, we also have two Nisses, each on five loyalty here. Nissa technically could ultimate at some point, and mm -hmm. we could see that happen. That's one way to break the stalemate is to just make a bunch of six sixes. Yeah, with this many lands on the battlefield. I have 18, right? You're at 18 on a 20, yes. Tamiyo is on Selfless Spirit then? Uh, Sylvan Advocate, I believe. Yes. Yeah. It was, in fact, those two. Oh, wow, we're seeing a, a massive combat here. Okay, so Marcio Carvalho looking to really take advantage of that self of spirit. 
interaction that you just mentioned where he could enter a fairly large ca combat and still have the bulk of his creatures survive, but this could be risky for him. As the blockers on the other side look pretty decent, especially the Reflector Mage with three plus one plus one counters on it and a three three first strike as well. Also, Brian could have a collected company here. It turns out he doesn't, but it, it is the sort of thing that Marcio has to worry about. Does Marcio feel like he's falling behind and needs to start making big attacks? This feels like a risky play. It is, and part of the reason that Marcio has more incentive is, okay. is that BBD has two Planeswalkers and Tireless Tracker going, and Marcio has not, just one Planeswalker. Knight on yeah. Duskwatch, Knight on Duskwatch, Duskwatch on... So as things currently stand, only the Selfless Spirit and a Reflector Major unblocked. BBD is go only going to lose a Duskwatch Recruiter, and BBD, I, I don't think, is concerning himself with cards like Dromoka's Command. I, I think he has identified that if Marcio has it, it's just going to be really tough for him in this situation. So he's blocking kind of as if, as if Marcio doesn't. This block looks fairly straightforward. The one interesting one is the Duskwatch Recruiter. It looks like, is it chumping a Shia up there? It is. And Otherwise, Marcio, these blocks are quite straightforward. Yeah, and Marcio, yeah, BBD put three threes on two twos and yeah. a five six on, on a four five. If Marcio sac wants to get Selfless Spirit's ability, he does have to sacrifice it before damage. So this attack looks like it's going to end up trading Selfless Spirit for Duskwatch Recruiter, and then, and then BBD draws BBD's a card get off a card the anyway. So yeah. that, well, two points of damage to get through with Reflector Mage, but this looks pretty good for BBD as things currently stand. So it's a very aggressive attack from Marcio. He's got a plan. Likely it will take place over multiple turns. And he's got some tough decisions to make here, but... He okay. He's going to sacrifice a clue and see what he finds. All right, he's going to get some he more... He found a Dromacus command right off the top. All right, so that, that definitely changes things. That's that's a that, that's a swing. So now, what Marcy is looking to do when you find something like command here, is line it up so that you get a good bonus out of the plus one plus one counter and a good bonus out of the fight. So one way to do that is, say, make one of those Duskwatch recruiters getting blocked by three threes into a three three. Okay. Have a Shia fight something like that big reflector mage, and then sack in response to all that sack selfless spirit, and that works out pretty well. Oh, this attack looks a lot better now. Definitely. And now Marcio is trying to decide how... So it looks like he's going to start off by sacrificing the Selfless Spirit. Yeah, and that, that is where all of this starts. Because at this point, it's, it's, Marcio is just going to need that indestructibility. And here's Dromica's command. The Tamiyo is on Selfless so, and this one, right? Yeah, so now we can Selfless. Selfless Spirit's already gone, so that's not happening. Make these two fights. And it sure. Won't, won't happen there either. Uh, before damage, activate Dustwatch Recruiter. Ooh, there's a collected company. Two companies. Two collected companies go to the bottom. Uh, uh, so damage. He also does I not hit a creature. This, this, and this. Uh, Tamio takes two, and I draw a card. Might make sense. Okay. Uh, he had attacked Tamio there. And he does end up drawing a card, though, because the original fight there did not actually kill the Reflector Mage. It took actual damage. Had BBD cracked a clue instead of using Duskwatch, the card on top was a Jamoka's Command. <laughs> now, now BBD's in a lot of trouble. Now he's way far behind, and that... Dromica's command off the top for Marcio Carvalho, Carvalho looks fantastic as it's really cleared away much of the board that looked dominant for Brian Brown doing. He hits a land off of Nyssa. She's at six. So Brown Doon is going to be able to reload his board fairly well here because at this point nothing's... Uh, no, nothing's stopping him from like playing a Thalia's Lieutenant, for example. But he, yeah, he really, he really is going to have a, a little bit of trouble just dealing with the fact that Marcio is now ahead and has all his mana untapped. He found another copy of Tamio. 
and he might be kind of resorting or be forced to resort to like minus two in the Tamiya that's currently in play to lock down two creatures, play Tamiya, minus two to lock down two more creatures, and kind of use that to buy time. But there, there you're trading resources away. So you, yeah. you, you're, you end up down on the exchange, but you, you do get some time. You do get some time, but unfortunately that would still leave two or one extra attacker there for Marcio. Can you? Like seven or something? Yeah, uh, eight. Currently on I'm eight cards. Minus Tamiya, targeting uh, Reflector Mage and Ashaya. Okay, Reflector Mage and Ashaya are going to get tapped down. They'll stay that way for a turn cycle. deciding how he wants to sequence his humans because it's not actually clear he wants the all the humans to be as big. He might actually want to grow Thalia's lieutenant. Command, put a counter on this. This fight's still going to have a good. Okay, well, he is starting to chew away at Marcio Carvalho's board a little bit here. He's neutralized two threats for a turn cycle. Now just took out the Sylvan Advocate. Now he's going to play the other copy of Tommy. Tommy, sure. Plus on... Knight of the White Orchid and the Dust Watch that has a counter on it. Okay. And uh, he's going to go ahead and attack Knight and get himself a card Nissa. here. And he's going to attack Nissa. And wow. Not bad. And Tammy is, of course, any combat damage. So Yes. And, and that Knight of the White Orchid now at five power, able to kill Nissa. Send her loyalty to zero and draw Brian Brown to another card. This turn has worked out very well for him. And now here's a Dust Watch recruiter as well. Yeah, that was a huge swing. Really now his well, Planeswalkers well, well played that turn. Yeah, by, that was by really Brown, nice. Yeah. yeah, he's left himself with a, a couple of two twos on blocks. He's got two two twos back to block. So, so Marcio does have good attacks here, but if Marcio attacks with that three three recruiter, Brian will draw a card. And <laughs> you may ask, how many cards is too many cards? Both players are very content to draw more and more. Their, cards. their appetite they, is strong. I mean, look, yes. look, look at how much resources they're trading off. Mm -hmm. Like. Their graveyards are just stacked at this point. Yeah, this, these last like two and a half, three turns have been uh, huge swings as far as board states. Now it's Marcio's turn to take yep. a, a stab at this, though. And he is going to activate his Duskwatch recruiter. He saw a Thalia and a Sylvan Advocate. And Thalia would have been absurd earlier this game. Like this, you know, the turns where BBD mm -hmm. needs to play multiple creatures to stabilize, Thalia just prevents that by making them enter the battlefield tapped. But. She's still going to be solid here. Yeah, Brian has three copies of Thalia in his main deck as well. Thalia actually a big concession to the Emrakul decks. It, it reduces the impact of Emrakul or Elder Deep Feed, which uh, at this point there are a few Emrakuls floating around. In fact, they've all left the building. <laughs> Indeed. So Marcio doesn't have quite enough damage to kill uh, either Planeswalker if BBD wants to, to oh, make some blocks. I uh, will double block your big Dust Watcher Raider. Brian's going to throw two creatures, two 2-2s two, two in front of the 3-3 three, three Dusk Watch Recruiter. Remember, that one also okay, is okay. under effect of Tamiyo, so he's going to draw a card. Thalia's Lieutenant is going to be the card that he decided to kill. And Thalia's Lieutenant has the, is the biggest long-term threat. Even though with tons of mana out, Dusk Watch Recruiter is also uh, fairly potent, so it wasn't an easy decision. It was a Lamholt Pacifist that he found, and you can see, once again, using up all that mana, save one land, is Marcio Carvalho, who just goes, Thalia, Dusk Watch, Noose Constrictor, go. Oh, maybe he still has game. those two Planeswalkers. Yeah, this game is game amazing. It's been unbelievable. <laughs> Another Nissa. BBD with like 14 lands in play. And then still 
he has millions of lands in play. Yet Plus Tamiya targeting the knight and the noose constrictor. Despite all those lands, BBD still has plenty of stuff to spend his mana on. And he's going to, in fact, going to attack with the Knight of the White Orchid here. The Noose Constrictor is also affected by Tommy. You get a 13. Marcio's going to take five damage here and get another card in hand. It was a tireless tracker now for Brian Brown doing. And the big thing Brian Brown doing has to worry about right now is the fact that all of his creatures uh, enter the battlefield tapped thanks to Thalia. So he, he's, at, he's in the kind of position where he can play a bunch of creatures here. Tracker. It's going to be tapped but he's not going to be able to assemble great blocks. Tragic Arrogance would be incredibly good for, for Brian right now. Reduce Marcio to like a Reflector Mage and one clue. Though, maybe he would have to give up two of his creatures and one of his Planeswalkers. Play a Forest, get a clue. Sure. Forest being basic, of course, does not get affected by Thalia. Drack a clue. And Brian just continues to churn through his library here, looking for as much as he can find. He just found a Thalia's lieutenant off the top. Needs to make sure he doesn't get killed in one one. fell swoop here by Marcio Carvalho. Something like a Gideon emblem or something like that could be responsible for a massive amount of damage. So what BBD has found here, well, he's found this tragic arrogance at the bottom. And by the way, both players... Has he gotten to the point? Both players are getting to the point where they need to keep track of the bottom of their library. Yeah, they actually are. Because uh, do you remember when he put that one down there? There's a couple dust watches ago. But by being able to bounce Thalia with that Reflector Mage, BBD now is able to play an untapped blocker and at least have two creatures up to block here. This is an interesting position. Remember, Brian could have used his, his Tamiyo to minus and lock down some threats, but instead he plussed, attacked, and left himself relatively shields down here after having suffered the effects of uh, Thalia for a while there. And Marsu doesn't have lethal here, even with the Reflector Mage he just drew, but he, he's not far off. So if Marcio, uh, we're in a position where if Marcio, you know, makes too many attacks, BBD does have a 5-5, a 4-3 five, five, a tracker, which is going to be able to grow, you know, a 2-3. These are, these are all creatures that can yet? crack back on the following turn. Four. Okay. And that can play Talia. Yes. So Marcio is going through the motions here because he needs yep. to figure out how much damage he can actually get in for and what these next couple of turns actually look like as far as getting the job done. He's down on life total right now, but it does feel like he's able to attack for a significant amount here if he wants. He's going to play, he's going to activate Duskwatch Recruiter yeah. and find another Selfless Spirit. Selfless Spirit's a big one. Well, it's, it's very small. It's the smallest creature, but it's a very big impact. It can, <laughs> it can make any gigantic combat kind of hinge towards Marcio. Yes. So Selfless Spirit Reflector Mage. And now is Marcio going to line up a big attack here? One BBD blocker, but one blocker left. Only has a 2-2. Two -two. He's attacking Nyssa with those two creatures. Nyssa is guaranteed. Marcio can guarantee kill both planeswalkers here. <clears throat> and the best Brian can do is trade a Duskwatch recruiter for a Duskwatch recruiter. He could. At, at the point where Marcio is guaranteed killing both Planeswalkers, which is, is happening now, four two-power creatures attacking Tamiyo, and then two creatures that could have three or power because the Noose Constrictor can grow, attacking uh, Nyssa. At that point, maybe he may just, just let, let, it happen. Let, let it happen and then try to, try to line up lethal on the way back. I mean, 
BBD doesn't is, is going to have a hard time doing that, though, because Marcio has, still has two blockers. He has mm -hmm. Reflective Mage and let's Selfless. Look, let's, let's look at BBD's uh, hand, though. He does have a Thalys Lieutenant in his hand. It's not the end of the world for BBD to have Nissa die as well, because he has a second Nissa in hand, which we'll be able to flip. Yeah, he also did get to draw another card there. Thanks to Thalia, no, or no. Tamio trigger. Tamio, exactly. As it turned out, it was a forest, but... Marcio once again asking if he had played a land yet for the turn. Judge says no. Did you not play land? I did not play Marcio, Marcio just passes the turn back. Noose Constrictor gives you a reason to not play lands, as well as maybe drawing a tireless tracker. Mm -hmm. So... There's oh, there's a tragic arrogance off the top for Brian okay. Brown, too. And now what does that do, Luis? <laughs> it means that Mar BBD can reduce Marcio to just a Reflector Mage, presumably being his, his weakest creature. Also, if Marcio doesn't sack a clue, he can eliminate one of the clues. What BBD loses is his three creatures, prob probably either hit, you know, losing Reflector Mage and Duskwatch, keeping either Tireless Tracker or Night of the White Orchid, but... What BBD gets to do, which is very powerful here, is play Arrogance first and then follow it up by playing a bunch of creatures. So, so he, it almost ends up being like a tempo type play. Now, one thing to keep in mind with Tragic Arrogance is that we're talking about sacrificing non land permanence. Right. So the Selfless Spirit will not prevent this. No. I, I suspect it will be sacrificed, but it will not, in fact, pre prevent the, the effect yeah. from occurring. Indeed. So this is another massive swing here in this game that has been absolutely unbelievable. And here we go. Let's see what happens to the board state after this. It's the tireless tracker versus reflector mage. But as you said, now this is the big turn. Now Brian is going to try to make his move where he plays as many creatures as possible, culminating with that Thalia's lieutenant to try to make the biggest board possible. <laughs> Does not have a force, and this is a shuffle, which could be interesting. Remember, there are two collected companies off the bottom. Remember that one Duskwatch recruiter activation showed us two of those. Now he has a potentially a better chance of drawing them as they were in the bottom six. His library is getting a little thin there. And, and this is what Tragic Arrogance does. Even if BB doesn't get up a bunch of cards, he's going to be able to go creature, creature, creature afterwards and end up with a pretty overwhelming board presence, though. So, and Marcio has server. access to his own Tragic yeah. Arrogance. It, it, if Marcio draws one of those... Nissa transforms as well. BBD's board went from empty to just you know, stock full once Plus again. Nissa. Another tireless tracker as well. Now, I believe that forest was just revealed. There we go, back in hand. A lamb hole pacifist. Reflector mage? Reflector mage? Oh, you, okay, okay. okay. I think so. Okay, I'm sorry. That's right. I reflect for the no. The tireless tracker? I reflect for the lamb hole and kill both twins. The lamb hole was yeah, reflector yeah, mage. Yes, the, 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 the oh, question, of course, yeah. is whether that yeah. lamb hole oh, pacifist was so, right? reflector yes, mage. Right. Yeah. And it was. When he... <laughs> Yes. One each. One each. <laughs> this game uh, has been incredibly complex. This is this is one of the longest. There's was that a collected company off the top, Luis? It was. So and now he's going to play the Thalia's lieutenant, but this could be setting up for a massive turn next turn for Brian Brown to win. And also the way that things have been maneuvered so far, even if Marcio finds tragic arrogance. I think there's a good chance BB just has five more spells on his next turn, whereas Marcio doesn't have a ton left, though. Marcio did draw one of the, the lone Eldrazi yeah, in, the, in this matchup. He did. He drew, he drew an Elder Deep Fiend off the top of his library there. So as it currently stands, we've got two gigantic Tireless Trackers and a Thalia's Lieutenant facing down against just a lone Reflector Mage. BBD also has Nissa on his side. So BBD is significantly far ahead on board, and Marcio has to, has to come back for that. That tragic arrogance was massive. BBD also ahead 20 life to 7 life, so Marcio is in the kind of position where even yeah. if he has a good Elder Deep Fiend turn, he could end up in a spot where he still can't quite kill BBD and he's at such low life that he can't be too aggressive. Carvalho down to 7 here in this epic game 3 between these two players at the World Championship. Pretty good chance this Elder Deep Fiend gets hard cast, by the way. <laughs> Plan A for the Bant Company deck. 
You're totally right. He's got eight mana lined up. It'll buy him a turn. Will it buy him much more than that is the question. <laughs> BPD's four lands ahead of Marcio. And he, you know, it may seem strange that I keep bringing up the land counts when they have 12 and like 15 lands respectively, 16 lands respectively. Both players are tapping out every turn. They're using all their mana. Yes. And, and that just means BBD plays an extra spell every turn. Yes. And this game isn't lasting 10 more turns. This game, you know, is lasting an, enough turns where those, those three to four extra spells are just a huge impact. You so know, BBD, tireless tracker number three for BBD. He's cracked more clues over the course of the game. Mm -hmm. Plus the Nissa, and he is going to find an Evolving Wilds. Now, that is going to enter the battlefield tap thanks to Thalia. He won't be able to sacrifice it. Thalia punishes Evolving Wilds significantly. Yeah, two, it comes into play tapped, gets a tap land. So I'm not even clear they can get a land at this point in the game. BBD is getting pretty close I, to being out of I basics. would guess he can't, yeah. He didn't have a forest. And here's the Lamholt Pass Fist that he now is able to cast, and this Thalia's Lieutenant is ticking combat. ever upwards. Now we're going to go to combat, and this is where we expect to see that Elder Deep Fiend now from Carvalho. Deep Fiend not great at ambushing tireless trackers that are, you know, 6'5", six, 7'6". Seven, six. <laughs> They're just bigger. Also, look at that. Four clues, all of which could be cracked here, and <laughs> the tireless trackers already have three and two counters on them, respectively. Taps. You have two cards in your hand. Uh, that resolves. Okay, Elder Deep Fiend uh, resolves. Taps mana. a land and three creatures. And this, I'm going to crack a clue. And he's going to float the mana there and then sacrifice a clue, which is going to put a counter on each of his tireless trackers. And he's going to find another Lamholt Pacifist. And these last two turns for Brian Bronduin have been amazing. And even though Marcy was able to not only tap down Brian Brondoon's team, but also uh, have a Thalia out, making sure that Brian can't play new blockers, Marcy just doesn't have enough damage to, to kill BBD. Brian, He's at 20. Brian's at 20, Marcio has 10 power. And Marcio's not playing Thalia's lieutenant, so Marcio's not able to have like a bursty amount of damage out of nowhere. What does he find? He finds a land off the top. Nothing for, Car for Carvalho here. If this clue doesn't yield anything, then Marcio's actually, for the first time, he's going to pass the turn with, like, 11 unspent mana. Let's see what he finds. This is huge. It was another land off the top, Luis. He whiffed, and that is going to do it for game three. What an unbelievable game. That was one of the most, that was one of the longest, most complicated, crazy games I've ever commentated. It was over an hour long, Luis. It was over an hour long, but it didn't feel like it because the game was just exciting the entire time. That was an awesome was. game. That was such an intense <laughs> match. And, <laughs> and I'll tell you what, Brian Bronduin is going to hug that uh, tragic arrogance <laughs> when he gets home because that was the card that seemed to really swing things for him in the deep late part of that game. Now, one question I had for you, Luis. Do these things ever come down to decking? Like, we saw Brian get down pretty low. Does it usually come to a natural end, or do we see people run out of cards in library in this matchup? It, it realistically is not going to come down to decking. I mean, you, you might, it might come down to whether you draw, like, your arrogance is at the right time, or, mm -hmm. you know, like Marcio, there's a, he put a, you saw he put a Gideon on the bottom with one of the mm -hmm. dust watches. There were some turns where a Gideon emblem would have really swung the game. So... I don't think that given the combination of cards in both players' decks, it can come down to decking because of Tragic Arrogance, wiping the board if it ever gets too crazy. But it, you can certainly see both players use up tons of resources, just an immense amount. Yeah. One of the really key sequences there, we, I just talked about the Tragic Arrogance being, uh, you know, really one of the biggest stamps on that game. But one of the ones that came earlier that really got Brian Brown doing back in it was Dromica's Command. Mm -hmm. Specifically the fact that he had two copies of it, which trumped the only one copy <laughs> that Marcio Carvalho had. And we saw three of them resolved in that rather complex sequence, ultimately resulting in, uh, in Brian coming out from a favorable position. Dromica's Command is, is crucial not only because it's one of the few like removal spells i mean the, the the bant shard is not is not famed for its uh, wealth of removal also because it like i mentioned during the match it can go really wrong when you have a fight lined up and you're like all right my you know my my four five is going to fight your four four 
And then they respond by making their 4-4 into a 5-5 and then having their other creature fight and kill your other creature. All of a sudden, your 4-5 just runs into their 5-5 and, and you end up just binning multiple cards to their one. So being the last person to put command on the stack is, is usually very, very good. And that's, that's what we saw in that interaction. Yeah, it went Archangel Avison, command, command, command. And the last one, of course, was for Brian there. Uh, one of the other cards that I think that Brian had a chance to draw and maybe affect the outcome of the game much earlier than that game actually went, but he ended up not finding it was Thalia's Lieutenant. And this is a card, you know, we were talking about um, Marcio having put Gideon on the bottom of his library there from a, an activation from a Death Squatch recruiter. And, you know, something like an emblem from Gideon can be very powerful in the late part of the game when the boards are both drawn out. But in BBD's deck, that two-mana creature, Thalia's Lieutenant, looks a lot like that anyway. Yeah, it's a Gideon emblem you can hit off of Collected Company. Uh, it's a two-mana card that you can sequence, like, you know, have a turn five or a turn six where you have two creatures in play, you play another creature, you play Thalia's Lieutenant, and all of a sudden you have a very good attack. Uh, one, one of the cool tricks with Thalia's Lieutenant, which uh, you actually did multiple times when I played him, was six mana, play Thalia's Lieutenant, trigger on the stack, cast Collected Company, which means that any humans you find off the company get the Thalia's Lieutenant counter. Oh, that's so cute. That, that's something that we might see come up in this match, depending on how late the game goes. You can see her leading the charge through the woods there. Back to our main feature match area here. Just two players left in our world championship. We started with 24. That was four days ago. And now uh, it's all come down to this. Brian Brown doing up two games to one over Marcio Carvalho. And Marcio has his work cut out for him. He is going to need to win back-to-back -back games in this tough Bant matchup, and uh, if he does, he'll be the world champion, but if Brian can win either of the next two, he's going to be holding that big trophy at the end of the day here. Take a look at it right there, in fact. And, and you mentioned uh, breaking serve, and Marcio, even if he wins this game, is going to be on the play in game five. I actually said stealing serve. Got <laughs> lambasted by the chat for that one. <laughs> well, when you make, you know, gigantic errors, then <laughs> the chat is going to call you out. I told him I'm not a tennis scientist, so... All right, looks like players are just about ready to present here, and we're going to be bringing you game four. This could be the one that decides the world champion. If not, we'll get a game five. Incredible to see these two gold pros in the finals as well. well one of them's not going to be gold anymore. It is. Very correct. And, you know, frankly, after the good performance that they both put up, they, they both have a good shot of not being gold by the end Certainly, of the next season. Uh, yeah. At the World Championships, you get a, a pro point per match win and uh, two pro points per match win in the top four. So both these players have locked up a, a significant amount of pro points. Mm. Okay, players are trying opening hands here for game four. Is this going to be the one that puts Brian Brondouin into that World Championship circle, or is this the one that's going to force game five for Marcio Carvalho? It's a close to optimal draw by Brian Brown doing double collected company, Knight of the White Orchid on the draw, two lands, Thalia's lieutenant. He he has all the pieces he needs. He has the pieces he needs. He even has the Lamholt Pacifist to play on turn two, so he has a two drop still because you don't want to play Knight of the White Orchid until turn three. If Brian can draw one land in the next couple turns, then I think he's in great shape. Even if he doesn't, he's going to be able to play turn two Knight of the White, or turn three Knight of the White Orchid, turn four Nyssa, and, and really not end up behind on lands despite missing potentially one land draw. Can our GP master parlay all that travel, all those countries, all those states, well, all those frequent flyer miles into a world championship? Marcio's got a good start, too. He's got news constrictor. This is a big draw step for Marcio. Marcio found a tireless tracker. What was he looking for there, Luis? A land. He's missing his land here? He's going to play a Sylvan Advocate, but he, Marcio, Marcio does not have a third land. Take a look at Marcio's hand. You can see gummed up with three drops there. He does have that Advocate that he can play. So this attack's interesting, too. BBD is choosing to trade... The, the pacifist for just two cards out of Marcio's hand because Noose Constrictor is presumably going to become a 4-4 four, four here. He's trading, he's trading his, his board presence for, for cards, but he's getting card advantage out of the deal. Uh -huh. and, and I think BBD figures his, his Lamhold pacifist isn't going to be attacking anytime soon. One kind of interesting bit of counterplay here is if Marcio misses a land drop, which he's not happy about, BBD doesn't get to play his Knight of the White Orchid. 
or at least doesn't get to get a land off of it, which is actually really which is super tough relevant, for BBD as well. BBD doesn't have a land either, does he? He finds another <laughs> Lamholt pass fist, so let's just run this whole thing back <laughs> we again. We might see the same dance again. Yes, it's a three drop off the top in the form of Nissa for Marcio, so we're going to just do it all over again. And if you're Brian, don't you just run it right back again? No, he's not going to block well, this One time. danger to blo not blocking is Marcio didn't play a land last turn, so you know that there's a chance he doesn't play anything this turn, and you want to flip your land hold pass. And that's exactly what happens. Both of these werewolves are going to transform here. This is a big draw step for Brian Brondo. Definitely. And he finds a reflector mage, so he has not hit. And it's so tough because that Krylon Horde Howler is going to let Marcio cast like something like a tireless tractor. <laughs> there is a land off the top now for Marcio Carvalho, though. Was it a fortified village? It was. So it's going to give Marcio the option. Of, he's going to play a third land this turn, which is going to let BBD Knight of the White Orchid for a land. But Marcio doesn't have a land to reveal for the fortified village, so he's not going to be able to play something like Reflector Mage this turn. Doesn't have white mana yet. Interesting to see if that news constrictor comes across again. Lamehold Butcher's a little bigger than Lamehold Pacifist. It, it, may, it may be interested in brawling. Marcio also, because of that Crown Horde Howler, he gets to play Nissa this turn. He gets to play Charles Track this turn. One of those two. And that's a big swing, too. Yeah. So, despite Marcio missing multiple land drops, he's not going to miss a land drop again for the next couple of turns. So, he just needed to either flip Howler or draw land. In fact, he did both. He's going to go with Nissa. Marcio also has that Elder Deep Fiend in hand, which has seemed very far away the last couple turns, but it's actually not as far away as you may think. Uh, another blue source and an emerge later, and all of a sudden, Elder Deep Fiend could just swing this game. Brian does seem to have the tools to win the long game here, with a pair of collected companies and a Tamiyo Field Researcher, as well as a Reflector Mage and a Nissa Vastwood Seer. But this is Marcio. If, if he can just get far enough ahead, he may be able to capitalize on that lead with that Elder Deep Fiend. <laughs> that would be an aggressive news constrictor attack, Marcio considering it for a second. You'd have to discard his hand. Sides, sides better against it here and passes the turn back. You can see that Carvalho did decide, in fact, to play the tireless tracker, not the Nissa that he had pulled to the front of his hand. So BBD did draw land this turn, but He's going to wisely uh, decide to wait on that one. Mm -hmm. So here's Knight of the White Orca. That's going to get a counter on the Thalia's Lieutenant. It's going to let him dig up a Plains, though in this case, you'll see that it's not a basic Plains. Got a Canopy Vista. I really like how this game is played out, where both players are missing land drops, and both players got out of it at basically the exact same time. So we're, we're going to see this game play out like a normal game, as if just two, two turns kind of didn't go by, in a sense. So it's going to be an interesting one. I think this is going to be a very close game. Carvalho found another land off the top. One thing Carvalho is lacking that BBD has is collected company. Because BBD has two of those, two you know, two solid company hits on each one, and this game could go from close to not very close. When you hit Reflector's Mage, Thalia's Lieutenant, or Tireless Tracker, Reflector Mage, or really Reflector Mage, Reflector Mage, anything, <laughs> yeah. uh, then, then the game gets a lot less close because that's just such a big swing. Because Marcio's kind of playing like, he's playing normal magic, right? He's playing, he, you know, one creature per turn. Though, Crawl and Horde Howler also gives you a bit of an edge in that department. It's actually going to let Marcio string together multiple creatures this particular turn. So if Marcio Reflector Mage is the, the Lamb Hold Butcher there, that does open the door for him to make some attacks. Yeah, and he is going to do that. Butcher back in hand. 
But luckily for BBD, he, because it's a flip card, he can actually then play the Pacifist next turn if he so desires. Two cards in hand. Two cards in hand left for Marcio Carvalho, who is going to attack with so, the news constrictor. So BBD can double block, and that's interesting. That forces Marcio to discard one card, otherwise the first strike of the Knight of the White Orchid kills the news constrictor, and then lets Marcio discard a second card and trade news constrictor plus two cards for BBD's two creatures. Which is a really interesting situation there, just because Marcio is looking to try to get ahead and stay ahead, and if you're thinking from Brian Brondewood's perspective, he wants to try to make this game go longer. So he's just going to take the damage rather than give up his board state here. And a big part of that too is he knows one of those cards is a forest from that Nissa. so maybe if he knew the other card is an Elder Deep Fiend, he would feel differently, but getting rid of a forest, treating two creatures for a forest, a Noose Constrictor, and a random card, it's going to put you very far behind on board. Yeah, it feels like he could just discard a couple of lands and you'd be unhappy with that transaction. Here's Nissa Vastwood Seer as Brian Brondwin continues to build up. He's decided not to play Collective Company here. And a big part of that decision is because now he gets to hit his land drops. Hitting land drops is important. And had BBD drawn a land, I think he would have been a lot more inclined to just play a land and maybe leave up company. But because he didn't draw a land, he's able to go Nissa up into Lampold, but a pacifist, and then ha still have you know two three threes and two two twos back to block. Marcio has double blue now, so he can, he can set up an Elder Deep Fiend. Marcio can attack for 9 damage right now, even 10 if he wants to discard a card, by uh, sacrificing one of the two power creatures, Deep Fiend tapping down uh, the four the four, the, blockers. The four blockers and yeah. then attacking with everything. But It put a lot of pressure on Brian Brondwin's uh, collected companies to come up with something. But I think... Marcio might be wanting to, to get, try to sneak in a little bit more damage and then set up a deep feed next turn. Pass. <laughs> Is that another collected company? Three's company, or three companies rather. Indeed. <laughs> Is this the turn where he just starts chaining those together? He didn't play one last turn. <laughs> BBD's hand right now is four four drops, and then ah. a three drop and a two drop. So, you know, it, it's kind of funny that we've over and over again seen BBD go with the most mana efficient plays. Last turn he played a three drop plus a two drop on five mana. This turn he's going to do the same. Marcy deciding whether he wants to sacrifice the creature targeted by a Reflector Mage to emerge Elder Deep Fiend here. What do you think Brian Brondewin's thinking about what Marcio just did there? He's trying to think what would you respond with, and one answer that comes to mind is Dromica's command. The other is Elder Deep Fiend, if Brian remembers that Marcio does have multiple copies of it. And there is Thalia's lieutenant here for Brian Brondewin, and Marcio Carvalho just puts his hand up and says, you did it. Now, this isn't the most devastating Lieutenant possible because one of his humans has turned into a werewolf and the other one's, well, an elf. Still pretty darn good. It's not bad. Marcio's n not going to be able to force through lethal quite yet because he does have to sacrifice one of his creatures if he wants to play the Deep Fiend. And, and Brian now has six creatures out, so even if four of them get tapped down, he might be forced into bad blocks, like Marcio leaves up you know, Nissa and a 1 on Thali's lieutenant, but he, he, won't, he won't be forced to, to take lethal damage quite yet. So when do I get to see the uh, never-ending chain of collected companies here from <laughs> Brian Brown doing? There's a good chance that this game ends without him being able to cast all of them. Because either Marcy is able to force through enough damage with this Deep Fiend, and Brian casts one or two, or Brian gets too much advantage out of the first one or two that he doesn't get to cast the third. All right. Well, right now, Marcio Carvalho is going for the Elder Deep Fiend. And it costs one less to emerge because of the Kralen Horde Howler. He is trying to set up lethal or some massive two-turn two swing. But Brian has a lot of creatures on the battlefield, six blockers up. You know, I think despite this turn, I think going well for Marcio, like Marcio's going to get a good attack in here. I 
think Brian's in pretty good shape. He's going to take some damage, but but having all those companies in hand really does help. Though Marcio's drawing up some cards off clues, so if Marcio draws like a Reflector Major, a Thalia, some swingy card like that, then then it could be a, a, a big. This could be a big change. It was a Sylvan Advocate off the top for Carvalho. You were the title right? Yes, sir. I did. Yes. Marcio just double checking about what exactly got Reflector oh, Marcio needed to take a point of damage off that Yavamaya Coast. He, he does have only Island Yavamaya Coast in play for blue sources. There you go. Okay, we got it. Gonna sacrifice a clue. Find another Ooh. tireless tracker. Drawing the second tracker when one's already been reflected aged. Not not really where Marcio wants to be. Because this game's progressing very rapidly. Indeed. Are we gonna see some chump blocks here from Brian Brown doing to protect his life total? Or uh, is he safe to take a bunch here? Well, this is exactly lethal if Noose Constrictor just, you know, goes off. Uh -huh. Actually one more because there's still a clue remaining. So something has to get blocked. It okay. could be anything, but it looks like a deduce constrictor. That, that saves the most damage. This would have Brian taking nine. Falling to seven, but then getting to untap with company at the ready and a bunch of creatures. That's it. Forest is going to get discarded to the Noose Constrictor, which is going to get it big enough to kill Nyssa. And there's a Sylvan Advocate for Carvalho, who passes the turn back to Brian Brown Dewan. Now he has full shields up again with all of his creatures untapped and that handful of collected companies. You know, if Brown Dewan hits Lieutenant... R Reflector Mage off a collected company? I think that would be lethal. Would it be lethal? Okay, well, here we go. Let's see what he hits off Find of this out. collected company. It is going to resolve. Lieutenant. There's a lieutenant. All right. And he also hit a Lamholt Pacifist, so this is going to be a big swing for Brian Brown right, doing. So there's going to be a lot of. <laughs> yeah. Triggers here, so. <laughs> there's going to be a lot of um, triggers, has been called. He's, he's <laughs> not kidding. Two humans plus the lieutenant, so I guess the three. This one sees the lamb, gets a counter, this gets one, this gives a two, this gives a seven. <laughs> Third um, folly is lieutenant on the battlefield. Sure. Now Brian just has to try to map out how he wants to feel out the rest of this game, right? I mean, he doesn't want to lose to maybe another elder deep fiend. Are there two copies of that? Yeah, there are two in Marcio's list. So BBD could attack for 26 here, but Marcio can block the largest lieutenant. But then BBD's in a position where maybe he gets attacked yeah, back I for, for lieutenant. Yeah, I actually missed one on this, but I, I missed it, so, yeah. Okay, so BBD could have um, put an, an extra one on the, the one with seven counters, could have actually had eight counters, I guess. Yeah, it looks like it won't punish him here, as that would be the creature that was going to get blocked anyway. going to pass the turn. And he's just going to pass. Look, he says, look, if I can't kill you this turn anyway, I don't want to lose to, well, well with Elder Deep Triple Thalia's lieutenant and double collected company out, BBD has a lot, of, uh, a lot of very live turns. That was a Gideon off the top now for Marcio. Does that change anything? So let's Marcio, Marcio has access to seven mana once he plays his land. So he can go like Tireless Tracker, play a land, play Gideon. S solid turn. But sure. even with a Gideon emblem, all these of... These creatures are just smaller. BBD's creatures, like he's got an 8-8 Thalia's lieutenant there. So we might see Gideon start making knights. Okay, and there's Gideon okay. from Marcio Carvalho. Brian has three collected companies. He's played one of them. He also has a Tamiyo Field Researcher in his hand, which could be a big deal. 
Cameo is a big deal. But are we just going to see another collected company here? Marcio Carvalho is also tapped out. I believe that was a tragic arrogance off the top there, Luis, though. <laughs> The board state seems to favor Brian Brown to win pretty significantly at the moment. Brian, tragic arrogance is, is good with, is, you know, when you're behind, and it can be okay when there's a stalemate, but I think Brian is, is getting to the point where he's, getting, he's building up a somewhat commanding lead here. Collected company, Marcio just puts his hand up. What is he supposed to do about this? There's a reflector mage and a tireless tracker. Okay, so solid hit here. So, uh, each of these are going to get two counters. Okay. This goes to three. This to five. To five. To nine. To nine counters on it. Um, I am going to Reflector Mage. Thinking about what to reflect your mage. We're going to see an attack here from Brian, right? Is it is it too soon still? It's really close because boards like this tend to favor the player on defense. You you get to you get to make a lot of the the, the really relevant decisions. But I think that these Dolly's lieutenants are getting big enough that maybe if you attack with multiple of them, you could get some action through. BVD's life total deficit does really lead to it being risky for him to go too deep, but. Uh, it might be it might be good for BBD to wait maybe just one more turn to make Not his bad. lieutenants bigger, but I, th I think we're going to see at least a little bit of action. Just something starting uh, to hit here. Attack. Just a 10-10. So what are Marcio's best blocks? He, if he blocks a Sylvan Advocate plus Elder Deep Fiend plus a smaller creature, then... Attack you with this lieutenant. Elder Deep Fiend plus the smaller creature die. I... Yeah, it looks like Mar Marcia's not even interested Marcia in that. does not want to do that. He's just going to jump block with the knight. And it's a land off the top for Carvalho. He has not drawn particularly well to this game. Carvalho, no collected companies from him thus far. The Gideon's nice. The Elder Deep Fiend was pretty good. He couldn't keep the tireless tracker on the battlefield. It got Reflector Mage last turn. Yep. So he's going to activate his Duskwatch Recruiter and find a Thalia Heretic Cathar. Again, as we've seen in other games, both players kind of have some engines going. Uh, Marcio's Clues, Gideon, this is what he's getting his advantage of, Dusk, Duskwatch Recruiter. He needs to actually just cast a clutch of company every turn. That's his engine. Yep, but that is his engine. It's not a bad place to be. So we're, we're seeing a lot of new cards get added to the board. But those, those Thalia's lieutenants are growing at a pretty fast clip. BBD now has his own tireless tracker. Marcio does have Thalia, which means BBD does not get to add to his board defensively every turn. But he's, he's playing enough creatures that I think he's still in pretty good shape. He just found a Dromica's command off the top. Still has Tamio in his hand. And that last collected company as well as the uh, Tragic Arrogance. You were saying this is the type of game these players love to play. Super complicated, very drawn out, lots of strategic choice. And that draw step there from Brian Brown to win, making it even more complicated, the Dromica's command. Company. All right, collected company number three for Brian Brown Dewin. And he missed on this one. Oh, the full whiff. That's got to feel good for Marcio. Marcio, you see him kind of nod his head like, okay, I've got a chance here. The third collected company had to feel terrible going on the stack, but the complete miss there from Brian gives him a glimmer of hope. All right, looks like Brian does not have Adromica's Command in hand. It's actually Tragic Arrogance and Tamio Field Researcher. Combat. Uh, I'll attack you. Once again, that one Thalia's Lieutenant is just going to keep yes. chipping away. Sure. Your turn. 
As it turns out, it's just these knight tokens that are dying. So now what is the game plan here for these players? Another land off the top for Carvalho. He can play that tireless tracker now, though. Marcio is somewhat forced to continue building, yep. you know, ba ba oh, with the engines he has. He has he has tireless trackers. He's got Duskwatch Recruiter. And so looks like he's just going to move towards that. That's how he's drawing his extra cards. That's how he's kind of getting ahead okay. each turn. But as you said, you know, Magic tends to favor the defensive player when it comes to massive combat like this. And Brian has still not been able to mount a huge offensive to really clean up the board. So Brian's going to sacrifice a clue. Draws card for the turn, like a landhold pacifist. Maybe he's a few lands shy, but if he could set up a turn of Tragic Arrogance plus Tamiya, that would also be very effective because he'd be able to reduce Marcio's board to one creature and then uh, attack for use 10. It, you tap it down, attack for 10. So he might be moving towards that by playing Tamiya this turn and setting up a Tragic Arrogance fueled win next turn. Or not win, but, but you know, Tragic Arrogance plus good attack turn. Now how risky is that from Brian's perspective? You know, Reflector Mage could really Tamiya. ruin that party. Reflector Mage could, could, would be tough. All right, well, here is Tamiyo Field Researcher now for Brian. And I'm curious to see what he does with it. He could take out two key blockers, or he could plus Tamiyo on two of his better attackers, or even just one of them, and, and a blocker on the other side. Given that he's been attacking with a gigantic Thales Lieutenant every turn, it would make sense to plus Tamiyo, make Thales Lieutenant, draw, draw him a card and deals damage. Maybe even attack with like two Thales Lieutenants. Like a 6-6 six, six Thales yeah. Lieutenant also just has good attacks here. Yeah. He also could target the Knight token, which has been the play that Marcio has made every this. time, to yeah. disincentivize a block with it. He could do that. Uh, the downside is that maybe Marcio the then Knight blocks with token. the Reflector Mage instead of the Knight token, okay. because there's not such a huge difference between the two of them. It does sure. give you a slight upgrade. He did that, actually, so... At you. If Marcio made the play he'd like to, it would cost him... It would draw two cards for Brian. A lot of counting here. This is actually a much closer game than it appears. It looks pretty evened up, but Brian being at seven life means that there's plays that Marcio can come up with here that really change yeah, that. Uh -huh. And so Marcio does end up just chump blocking. Now he did find a Dromica's command. That's certainly going to come in handy at some point here. Sure. Marcio's going to sacrifice a clue to draw a card. Put a couple of counters on his tireless trackers. He does have two of them. And remember, Marcio also has access to Tragic Arrogance, so mm -hmm. you really want to be the first person to cast that. that that's going to give you a, a significant advantage, and BBD doesn't have forever to, to wait on his. Now, I'm assuming that that Thalia's Lieutenant is not a great Reflector Mage target, <laughs> it's even not, though it's a 10-10. As tempting as it is to bounce a 10-10, <laughs> if it comes, out, comes back down, it distributes, what, 3, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10 counters. <laughs> so you didn't get a whole lot of an advantage yeah, there. Yeah, no. I say that because Marcio did find a Reflector Mage off of that clue. It does give you a two-turn delay, though, so it's possible that Marcio is interested in that, but other tempting targets are creatures that have a bunch of plus-plus one counters. Yeah, she chose the Tireless Tracker. It only has one counter on it. Make a knight token. These are some very well-developed boards we've got. Once again, this is similar to last game. Marcio basically out of gas in hand. He's just got a planes, but he's got four clues sitting on the battlefield. Can sacrifice a couple of those, keep the land drops flowing, and keep those tireless trackers moving forward.
So is this a turn where we see that tragic arrogance come down? Do we see tragic arrogance plus Tamio combine to to let BBD? Well, he could put Marcy on a very short clock. He could also kill the Gideon, which means you're giving up a lot of damage that you could go to the opposing player, but that Gideon is going to make a, a blocker next turn. Also, Tamio's at five. He could minus minus over the course of the next two turns. Looks like he's going for it, Luis. Here it comes. Five mana. Marcio's, you know, he's got an incentive to sacrifice so much of clues in response, so the tragic arrogance clears those out too. So that'll even tap Marcio out, which gives BBD the kind of the green light to, to enact his plan. Okay, so here's a clue. And here's another one for Marcio. Not really bothering to put counters on Tardis trackers. He just knows those aren't those, those aren't, aren't going anywhere anyway. anyway. <laughs> of the four There's possible counters, he, he put clue. one. <laughs> and I'm gonna keep Tomio and this. So he kept his biggest creature, as we predict. Tragic arrogance has just been a giant ruthless disposal. These both these matches, both <laughs> players just sacrifice all their creatures. All their creatures, basically. And the basically is the rub. BBD gets to keep a ten ten, and Marcy gets to keep a two two. Yeah. Or is it? There it is. I like BBD's 7-10 split of permanence here. He's going to draw Maka's command. Uh, counter on this and fight this. And does that let him draw cards here with Tamio as well? Th that's the, that's the idea. Okay. Attack Gideon. He's going to attack Gideon. Draw a card. He's going to play his land for the turn and pass. So this was Brian Brown doing huge play to try to get back excuse me, to try to win the world championship, this could be the sequence that wins in the game, that tragic arrogance once again. Oh, it's B a tireless tracker off the top. BBD has the end game in his sights yep. here, but he, he's not going to be able to kill Marcio next turn. He can attack for 11, maybe up to something like 15 if he plays multiple humans. But he's definitely setting it up. He's getting to the point where he's going to want to like use Tamiya's minus twice. He's going to attack you know, fill up his board with creatures this next turn. So even if he doesn't literally del deliver lethal this turn, he has Marcio on a two-turn clock, and, and Marcio's not, not going to have enough time to crack all of those clues unless he finds something like Reflector Mage, finds yeah. something like his own tragic arrogance. That's what's going to be huge here. You can see that Marcio has a Lumbering Falls there as well. Oh, he's looking at just getting aggressive. He's yeah. just going to attack. That's going to put Brian Brown Dewan down to four. So what that does is it gives Marcio the opportunity to go Sylvan Advocate plus Lumbering Falls, attack for five if he can find a Sylvan Advocate and if he can find a way to remove any blockers BBD might have. So the big key here for Brian is to put up a ton of blockers while being able to keep that pressure going. And that's definitely a desperation move by Marcio. It's, it's smart to try to end the game when you're behind on cards. And Marcio just looks at the situation and thinks, I've got access to two cards. My opponent's got an 11-11 and five cards yeah. in hand. I'm not winning with a, game. a planeswalker. Right. I'm not winning a game by just playing out normal creatures. I'm just going to try to attack you with Lumbering Falls. Next turn, set up Advocate Lumbering Falls and kill you. Problem is, Marcio's missing the Sylvan Advocate part of the puzzle. Right. And BBD is going to be able to play some blockers. So this is this is definitely an uphill battle for Marcio. Brian Brandwin may be closing in on the World Championship here. He's up two games to one over Marcio Carva Carvalho. Deciding whether he wants to tap uh, a clue on or not. Uh, tracker, counter on this. Tracker, counter on this. He's not going to be able to get it up to 19, but it is going to be a two-turn clock. Knight of the White Orchid is, he, he does, will fetch BBD a land here, which is still, still nice at this stage in the game. That thing has 12 counters on it now. Nice. Knight of the White Orchid, counter, and search. <laughs> Marcio's going to double check, but this is Brian Brown doing, setting up for the 1 2 punch to win him the trophy. Yeah, this is a 14 point swing with Thalia's Lieutenant, which, again, not quite lethal, but definitely sets things up for, for next turn. And like you said, he needed to play some blockers to make sure that he doesn't die to that. Lumbering Falls, and he's done exactly that. He's played three blockers out, still has Tamio at the ready as well. Can he close it out? 
Duskwatch He's it's even a, got a Duskwatch recruiter 15 as well. <laughs> that was Lieutenant. 15? It is uh, 15, yep. Yeah. Get a 4. All right, Marcio Carvalho falls to four. Right, the life totals are equal, and this is going to be it. Marcio has to find a way. He needs tragic arrogance. He, he found an Archangel Avison here, Lily. Oh, he's so close. Remember, Brian has a tireless tracker in his hand. It was what we're showing here. The flash on Archangel Avison means that Tamio's not going to be able to get her out of the way. But at this point, Brian has four other creatures, though the, the Lamphold Passpus can't attack quite yet. That's very important right now. He needs to get yep. two of them through to win the game, well, though Tireless Tracker does it by itself. Any creatures that Marcio casts before are going to get, can potentially get tapped down, but interestingly... The Lumbering Falls cannot. Same thing with Archangel Avison. If Marcio can find a way to survive the turn, oh, he's one blocker short. Because he, he needs to he needs to find a way to survive the turn and, with an Avison and end up with an Avison in play. And she's an indestructible blocker, so she does work out quite well. The problem is if Marcio passes without doing anything, BBD doesn't have to use Tamio before combat. He can just attack. Yes. And then if Marcio plays Avacyn in combat, BBD post-combat taps her down with Avacyn. God, this finals has been unbelievable. Brian Brown doing his sitting, awaiting his fate, watching Marcio. Oh, the pacifist, of course, can't attack because of the Thalia's lieutenant. It does not look, just look at itself. <laughs> but it just it, either way, it means that Marcio is... Multiple blockers short. He needs to find tragic arrogance at this point. That's right, and sure. he's going to dig or for it right now. So here's a clue being cracked. And he mm -hmm. finds a Sylvan Advocate. That's not good enough. Collected company into the right sequence could potentially do it. You need to get... Basically, you need four blockers. And none of them can be in play before Tamio <laughs> is activated. That, th th this, is, this is tough. This is incredibly difficult position for Carvalho. He's got three clues on the battlefield still. Yeah, he's, he, he, clues make this exciting, because otherwise Marcio would, would know his fate. But right now, he, he, he gets to draw multiple cards here to try to find an answer. Let's see if he can do it. He's going to sacrifice another clue. What does he find? He finds a Duskwatch recruiter. Not what he was looking for. One more draw. He He's still exactly has, enough he for has tragic enough mana exactly enough. to cast, sacrifice it, a clue. And if he can find tragic arrogance, put himself back in this game. Reduce BBD to a lone Knight of the White Orchid or, or, or Lamhold Pacifist. Marcio's fate right here. This is it. It's contained within this clue. He's going to sacrifice the clue. What does he find? He finds a forest, and that's, that's it. it. Brian Brown doing is your world champion. He has defeated Marcio Carvalho three games to one, and he is your world champion. Take a look at Brian Brown doing. Thank you. Good match. Thank you. Soak it I in, Brian. This is project. your moment. <laughs> you never start tragic? Yeah. Thank you. Big hugs from his friends and uh, supporters down in the crowd there. He says, you never found the tragic arrogance. And that won it for Brian Brown doing our world champion here for 2016. Wow. <laughs> that was, that incredible was a incredible stuff. That was one of the most intense matches I've ever seen or covered doing magic tournaments. I've been doing these for a while now, and that I mean, my hands are actually shaking now from watching it. <laughs> yeah, that incredible was an incredible stuff. match. Uh, really well played on both sides. Yeah, it was really fun to watch. That is going to do it here for our live coverage, at least in the feature match area. Let's send it up to Rich on the top deck. Absolutely amazing stuff.
I've been joined by Brian David Marshall and Ian Duke from Inside R&D. Ian Duke, R&D, can you people cook or what? <laughs> These games were amazing here all this weekend. I mean, that final match, games three and four especially, just what a marathon, what a battle. Brian David Marshall, we're on the top deck here at the Paramount Theatre. Clue, no, clue, no, clue, no, handshake. I mean, for nothing happening, quite a lot happened there. <laughs> that was, you, you know, normally you get a game to end with one top deck opportunity. There were three there at the end of that game. It was unbelievable. And that game three was just one of the most exciting, longest drawn out matches of Magic I've ever seen. It and I think Brian Brodewin might have seen every single card in his deck over the course of that game when you account for lamp, um, for the, the, the Dustbox dust and Crude activations. We, we can certainly go back and have a look at that. If you want a little bit of homework, <laughs> go and watch that game three. You'll need to set aside an hour and a half, sure, but see whether every card got seen by BBD. Listen, we'll draw a breath. Still to come on our show today, we have The Curtain Call, a 30-minute show packed with news, views, information about all the formats We've got a very special announcement from Louis Scott Vargas that you will not want to miss. We've got the award ceremony coming up. We've got a whole day of Kaladesh coming tomorrow. But why don't we take a breath and go right back to the start of the day when we still had not one, not two, but four players still in contention for our world title. This is how we began with Brian Brown doing of the United States with Bant Humans against the Bant Company deck of Shota Yasuoka. Uh, and Ian, both players felt they were a little bit of an underdog in the match. Um, the way it played out, it was 3-0 to BBD, and you were in the booth. It was a bit of a disappointment, really, as, as a sweep. Was, I wouldn't say it was a disappointment, but okay. going into the match, it looked very close, looked like either player could win, but Brian Brown Dewan did sweep the match in three games to zero. How often do you think that would happen? If we if we made them play the match out a hundred times, how often do you see the sweep like that? Um, a quarter of the time. Right. Maybe? Okay. Yeah. Maybe. Right. So uh, we had BBD advancing. Uh, let's take a look at our bracket once again. Then we came into our second semi-final, and this featured the European representative in the top four. This was Marcio Carvalho of Portugal, of course, and he was up against Oliver Two of the United States. So we had our second band company deck, and then it was Turbo Emrakul. Uh, Brian David Marshall, what happened in this one? Well, you know, we, we saw this go to the band company deck, and you know, you saw that the Turbo Emrakul deck is, has got all the ability to dig through its deck and do a lot of stuff. We saw a great game where Oliver Two got to uh, hang on at two life for many, many turns, returned many, many cards from his graveyard. But in, but in the end, the deck has a lot of kind of dead areas to, to draw from and it looked like and he just was run over by the band deck in the end. Uh, yes yeah, so it was 3-1 to Marcio Carvalho advancing to the final so we then knew it would be either the United States the number one and number two seed and it was fitting because they had drawn in the penultimate round they were in with rounds to spare they had set the pace they were the two overnight leaders uh, at six and one so they really followed through bdm on the weekend a absolutely and interesting also in this field of 24 players they were the only two players who came into this without achieving platinum over the course of qualifying for this event uh, you know, it's both the two gold pros, so even even more at stake in this match for, for these two, uh, you know, world championship competitors. Right, and whereas Marcio has had plenty of success from as long ago as 2005, he was a Grand Prix champion in Lisbon, 2008 Portuguese national champion. BBD, he's someone who really has paid his dues at every rung of of the ladder and you know we are surrounded by hall of famers and pro tour champions and we talk about these super teams whether you're channel fiber or you're ultra pro but ian in the end if you keep loving the game and you keep working away you can edge your way to the next rung of the ladder and sometimes the ladder takes you all the way to the paramount that's absolutely true brian brown doing a player with a lot of uh, kills under his belt a lot of uh, magic victories He's been a player who's been known as a grinder. He's played on an open series. He was our GP master for the year. And he is someone who has definitely worked his way all up the ladder, just as you said, Rich. And I think for the larger Magic audience out there, people who are kind of just beginning, he's a great inspiration for what you can do with a lot of hard work and effort. You and I were talking before the event that you can only beat precisely who's put in front of you. And through all the Pro Tours this year, and B uh, BBD doesn't have a phenomenal record at the Pro Tour level, 
but he has won more games of Magic than almost anyone in this field, and success breeds success. Absolutely playing his way all the way through Grand Prix throughout the year, uh, and getting just tons of reps, tons of wins, and probably won more matches of Magic than just about anybody on the Pro Tour this season. So once we got to the final, Marcio Carvalho, BBD, Bant Humans against Bant Company. Ian, I know lots of people are going to be playing this matchup uh, and trying to work out what could be done, what should be done the next iteration. Did you have a sense of, of which deck should be favored coming in? That's a fantastic question. I think it really comes down to whether the game goes quickly or the game goes long, and also the sideboard cards like Tragic Arrogance we saw really being the determining factor as those games went late. Now, I mean, you and I were talking before the final about Thalia's Lieutenant and saying how important that could be, and as the, and equally, BDM, you were down with BBD talking about dice. Never mind cards, what about dice? What were you saying there? Well, he, you know, he, I asked him, what, you know, if we look at your board quickly, how can we assess if you're winning? And he's like, if I have a lot of dice. If I have dice on six creatures, I am probably winning that match. So in the end, that was a 16-16 Thalia's <laughs> Lieutenant? He had a lot of dice on one creature. <laughs> yeah, it was 6 6 He, he went three. to three dice. Speaking of working your way up the ladder, that Thalia's Lieutenant started out <laughs> as a 1-1, one, one, and uh, you know, by the end of the game, 16-16. We should take a moment just uh, to congratulate the other players who made uh, this Super Sunday so wonderful. Shota Yasuoka is already a Hall of Famer at BDM. There's no way Oliver too could yet be a Hall of Famer. His story is just beginning. Not for nine more years. This right. was his, his first, uh, Oliver II's first Pro Tour season, mm -hmm. and you know, a, a pretty incredible run. And this was his first uh, Sunday appearance uh, throughout that year. So, you know, expect bigger and brighter things from him as he moves into the next season of the Pro Tour. And, and to me, and the most impressive thing about Oliver is the way he dealt with pressure, because he was not pace setting. Remember, in the last round on Thursday, long time ago it seems now, he was drawing with Steve Rubin to end the day at 3-3-1. Three, three, and one. And by the time we reached Modern, he just had to keep on winning. So to go 4-0, oh, knowing that every match is elimination, that was tremendous steel and the under pressure. Yeah, indeed. It's a difficult feat and a tremendous amount of pressure, even for the most experienced of players. But for a younger player and someone who doesn't have a lot of experience on the big stage, it's just absolutely outstanding to see uh, that kind of tenacity hanging in there in the tournament and making it to the top four. Want to mark your card for what's still to come here at PAX because there's still a ton of great stuff to come. We've got the awards ceremony coming right up. Then it's the Curtain Call, our 30-minute rap show featuring Louis Scott Vargas, JC Tao, Joel Larson will be up here, a cavalcade of the, your favorite casters working through the World Championship and some takeaways from PAX. And then tomorrow we're back again. We've got the Inventor Spell Slinging Showdown, Blogger Talk Live will be here from 1 p.m. Pacific. And in the closing program, I think we don't want to give too much away, but suffice to say, in the closing program, there are some things that you will want to get your eyes on. So great stuff there. But if you are just joining us, the news here is we have a 2016 Magic the Gathering World Champion. It is Brian Brown doing. There you see him. He looked pretty happy. That was taken before this event began. <laughs> I imagine when we see him down the stairs on the stage in just a moment, uh, he'll be pretty thrilled there. And I know UBDM can't wait to take him away and get him sat down and work through his weekend and just find out what's going on in the head of the I, 2016 I, World Champion. I just want to hear about game three of the finals. <laughs> so you, you, you've set aside an hour then, have you? <laughs> yeah, I just, I just want to hear about that game and, and, and how do you stay on top uh, of all of those decisions and, and how do you get to the point where you're able to break through there? Well, great news. It is time to head down to the floor of the Paramount Theatre. Here's Marshall Sutcliffe. It's time for the award ceremony for the World Championship 2016.